Hey everybody, uh, thanks for coming to our first of two acoustic training classes. This is the advanced class. A few people asked me why you're doing the advanced class first. Just like to throw a lot of curveballs. No, we're um, our our class curriculum is set up to be on Tuesdays, and then when there's an opportunity for a basics class, we're following up the first class um, a couple of days later. So um, we're covering some of the same content. Little bit, yeah. And I wanted to introduce uh, our speaker today, Christine Sick from Price Industries. Um, a little bit about my experience with Price is I've repped other brands of silencers in my long and somewhat illustrious, not really, career. Um, but I never really, we, you know, metal form like Mark, uh, trying to think of commercial acoustics, um, aerosonics. And honestly, God, I never learned a thing any of those manufacturers like i knew what a silencer or box um i couldn't tell you which way oops fixing that you turn your speaker down just a sorry i'm just getting a little fever. um anyways when price got into the business you started learning a lot more about acoustics and found it to be pretty interesting. I'm just going to move over here because it's a little bit of feedback. Um, so Chris is in, uh, what is your title, Chris? Uh, general manager. for General North. manager. So he's the big cheese of acoustics <laughs> over at Price. Um, so I've watched Price start with nothing. And now they're the leading silencer, I would say, first of all, educator and probably the largest, well, maybe the largest manufacturer. We're up there. Right there. One, two, yeah. yeah. Top two. Um, for acoustics. So there's a, a lot to learn. Um, even if you're not going to do your own acoustic path analysis or get on roofs to do property um, distance, um, you know, neighbor DBA calculations, it's really important to know at least some basics about acoustics, number one. And then number two is, you know, who should I turn to? Because you can definitely find a charlatan who will sell you something that you don't need. So Price does a lot of great stuff, all the way from telling you you don't need a silencer, to building silencers, to building panels, to building um, integrated systems. So there's a lot to learn today, and we're going to um, do a really cool tour. So thanks for coming remotely, and especially those who are in person. We want to see you guys here. Um, so Chris, without further ado, the floor is yours. Appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks, Tom. All right, well, let's kick things off here. Excited to be here, everyone, and thanks for joining us. As Tom mentioned, acoustics are kind of a, a bit of a unknown for many people. They're often forgotten about during the engineering design stages. It's often one of the biggest complaints in commercial buildings is it's too loud, it's too noisy, I can't sleep, it's annoying. And I hope today and the session on Thursday brings some light to what is all this crazy acoustic stuff about? We've got a really exciting day planned here. We got about three hours or so. So bear with us, grab some coffee. And uh, I really encourage participation. If you guys have questions, if you want to make a comment, throw your hand up anytime. If you're virtual on the meeting, unmute yourself, raise your virtual hand. We'll try and include you as well. But uh, this is going to be an exciting day. And I hope you guys take a lot away from this. The first session this morning is going to be sort of an interesting one on looking at the noise control performance data and sound testing in general. We're actually gonna have a live feed to our Price Research Center North, which is about a 30,000 square foot testing and research and development center that we have. And we're actually gonna go there through the power of Zoom to take a look at our noise control testing facility. A little bit better than uh, video or some pictures, we'll do a live streaming tour of that facility. Wanted to take a second to introduce myself as well. My last name is horrible to spell but relatively easy to pronounce. I pronounce it Desic. I've heard every pronunciation possible, so I won't feel badly if you say it wrong. I've got a background in mechanical engineering. I'm a professional engineer myself, and I've been with Price for, it'll be 16 years now. Started at 2007 when we were really getting into noise control. We built our lab in 2006, 2007, and we really greenfield ourselves into this noise control world, uh, creating a catalog, developing products, testing to the latest standards, and we're going to go through a lot of that today. I oversee sort of our noise control division as the general manager. We have a lot of great people 
in our division that can help you as well. If you're facing noise issues, if you're working on projects that are sound sensitive, please reach out to us and the airflow team to help you through these challenges. We've got a lot of experience in that area and you'll learn about a lot of that today and Thursday. So the first section I wanted to start with is really looking at acoustic performance data and the laboratory that we use for measuring and testing sound. Okay. This is a picture of the lab that we're gonna do a virtual tour of shortly, but I wanted to give you some understanding of what we do in this lab and why. The main purpose of the area we're gonna to tour today is for testing prefabricated duct silencers for what we call dynamic insertion loss, generated noise and pressure drop. Silencers primarily remove noise from a duct system. When you have a fan or an air handler or some sort of ducted path, the silencer will absorb and attenuate that noise. The setup that we typically use looks like this, where we have a source chamber, the ductwork, and then finally a reverberation room. And we use this test setup for basically measuring the amount of acoustical absorption and insertion loss that silencers provide. We're actually going to look at this live in the lab, but the mock-up here helps to explain it quite easily. We typically start by generating noise and transmitting that through a series of different duct systems, different sizes, different shapes, to be able to mimic the silencer that we want to test. We then insert a silencer into that test setup and we measure the noise reduction through that silencer. With and without that silencer in place is the deduction of sound or insertion loss. When you measure the empty duct compared to that silent system, you can get a feeling for how much sound removal is there. One of the big things I want you to be aware of is that we test to a very specific standard, this ASDM E477 standard. And that's the standard that's written for measuring and testing silencers. One of the interesting facts is that the dash at the back of this standard has changed many times over the last 30 years or so. And the latest was in 2020, which you can see denoted by dash 20. I'm gonna talk in detail about that standard and what's changed on it and most recently with the 2020 revision, but just be aware of it at this point that the ASTM E477 standard is an important one with respect to noise control and sound. Again, this is a quick schematic of the lab that we're gonna throw to the guys up in Winnipeg to tour with us, but you can see it's a large facility and area for testing noise control products. One of the most impressive parts of the lab is at the back here, this reverberant sound chamber, which is actually a large concrete box that is used for making a very reverberant live space to measure sound. There's many different pieces and parts to the lab itself, but why don't we actually try and uh, cross my fingers for technology. Um, we'll throw this up to the gentlemen and our events team in Winnipeg. Edgar Deroni is one of our senior lab engineers. He's been with Price for even longer than I, I believe, and he's going to help us through touring the lab with uh, Stephen Tomlinson, who's one of our engineers as well in Winnipeg, and uh, and Laura on the events team is also helping here. So I've never done this before, so bear with me. Hopefully it works well, but uh, this is exciting. Appreciate you guys helping with this and and offering to do a, a virtual live tour. So Stephen Edgar, hopefully you can hear me and. Uh, We'll pass it to you. Yeah, thanks, Chris. Can you hear us? Yeah, sounds great. Perfect. So welcome to Winnipeg, everybody. Uh, we're here in the PRCN lab. Uh, we're going to give you guys a walkthrough and a demo of a silencer test and kind of the equipment that we use to do that testing. Uh, so to start, or maybe a bit more of an introduction to myself. Yeah, I'm Stephen Thomason. I've been with Price uh, since 2013, kind of starting as a summer suit and then working through a few different roles here. Uh, right now, my current title is Hydronics Lab Leader, but I'll be joining the uh, Chris team as well. Uh, Edgar, if you want to introduce yourself. Yeah, I'm Edgar Droni. I've been here since 2006, as what uh, Chris said. I've been here long. So I started as a lab technician, and uh, uh, now I'm currently uh, working as a lab leader as well for acoustics and been uh, with the different standards like ASTM, HRI, and ASHRAE. So that's it. Thank you for joining this morning. Awesome. 
All right, we're going to start at the beginning of a sound test. So if you guys follow me around. So kind of at the start of the sound test, we have our acoustic louver here. So we have our airfoil louver. We take a peek inside. Um, essentially, this is either going to be a supply or exhaust, depending on the type of test that we're running. So we have a fan kind of on the other side of this acoustic louver and bank of silencers. Uh, that we use to mitigate any sound from that fan from coming back into the test space. Um, Do you want to? All right, we'll take a look. Uh, we'll kind of sneak around to, to the fan and you want to follow me here. Has anyone been to Winnipeg? Uh, All right. <laughs> So this area here is we have some acoustic panels on display. Uh, so they're lining the walls. I don't know if, it, if the sound is any different for you guys um, on your end, but typically when you walk through here, you can really feel that uh, the pressure change on your ears and uh, these acoustic panels really deaden the sound in this space. Um, the acoustic panels, so they're, these are built uh, in-house and designed in-house. We have them tongue and groove, so they kind of slide together easily. There's channels on the floor and ceiling. Uh, so they're a really quick install. Typically they're used kind of around any noisy equipment. So if you have a mechanical room that uh, has some noisy equipment and it's next to some sound sensitive spaces, uh, these are a great option to kind of line that room to really mitigate any of that sound from escaping out. Um, these are can be pre-designed. So they have the hole cutouts for electrical. Uh, as you can see up on the ceiling there. So those would be designed into the panel. So they're ready to go on the job site and the contractors can just work and install kind of right into them uh, without having to drill holes. So uh, yeah, and also very custom to kind of fit around different geometries. We have like a slope ceiling in there as well as the, uh, the corners that are solid uh, pieces. So. so this is the first step. So this is the first uh, part of our uh, four part system. Uh, this is a fan room. We have here the uh, reversible beam axial fan that can deliver up to 30,000 CFM at uh, four inches of static. And uh, we employ uh, silencers on the inlet and discharge either way, of course, this is reversible. So we can test the silencers, both uh, supply and exhaust mode. And we measure airflow on the uh, ceiling here. We have the measuring station. We have a 14 inch vein, and uh, we have also the 30 inch vein on the, these are all in-house uh, uh, developed by airflow measuring stations. One is for measuring low flow up to 4,000, and the other one is for measuring 10,000. And we, if we need more than uh, 10,000 CFM, we put them together and measure them uh, uh, simultaneously. All right, we'll head back out. If I talk, can they hear us? Yeah. Hey, just a question for you guys. When you're yeah. doing your um, acoustic testing, are you taking into account the noise created by the fan? Or are you, I saw some big silence in there, silencers in there. Are you eliminating the noise and just, I know there's a speaker. Yes, uh, that's a good question. So we're, uh, limiting the noise as uh, Steve mentioned here we had those uh, silencer on the inlet as well as silencer on the supply side of the fan so those uh, uh, noise generated by the uh, fan is already uh, taken care of as it uh, go to the uh, source chamber that's our next uh, station okay thank you thank you so the fan is sort of silenced and it's only the air from the fan that we're using the noise is actually generated at a known source. So our next station is uh, the source chamber. Inside this source chamber, I don't know if I can uh, show you, but uh, we have uh, two uh, big speakers here. Oh, we lost the video there, Edgar. Oh, we're back. Okay. Oh, yeah. We're good. So inside this, uh, Source chamber, we have uh, two big speakers, three, I mean, uh, three big speakers, uh, about uh, 
5,000 watts total and can uh, uh, develop up to 115 uh, decibels across the uh, uh, spec spectrum from uh, 50 hertz to 10,000 kilohertz. And uh, here we're going to the next uh, station, which is the uh, uh, duct system. But before we uh, go to the uh, next station, I would like to uh, mention to you the one uh, from the, the slide here. We have the uh, uh, four part system. One is the uh, fan room that supplies uh, air. And then we have the source chamber that uh, uh, mimic the, uh, the sound generated by any equipment or anything that we need to silence. And then we have also the uh, elbow source chamber for testing uh, elbow silencers and the uh, duct system. That's where we uh, test the silencer and uh, the reverberation room. So next we go to the duct system, how we Test the silencer. So this is our uh, uh, duct system. We have a 24 by 24 duct work. The duct specs is about a uh, uh, beep up, uh, 14 gauge inner casing. We have uh, like uh, two sets of uh, drywall, uh, two sets of uh, insulation, one set of drywall, and 18 gauge uh, outer casing. The purpose of this. Uh, Beep of a test duct is to uh, uh, isolate the uh, flanking noise from the system. So we don't want uh, the noise to be coming in and out of the, like, uh, or bypassing the silencer unit to be tested. The way we test silencers, maybe I'm just gonna uh, give you a brief overview and uh, uh, Chris might give you more in detail. So with the silencers, we put the, uh, we call it empty duct work. This is the empty duct work. There's no silencer yet. This is our baseline for our testing silencers. We run with and without airflow. And then uh, we run, we put the silencer in with the same uh, duct section taken out. And then we test again the same uh, test points. The difference would be the uh, insertion loss of the uh, silencer. As well as uh, we also test uh, generated sound noise uh, in, corp in uh, conjunction with the insertion laws. Any questions, sir? So it's actually sort of advantageous to have a tight system. Exactly, yeah. yeah. For your testing. The tighter and the better duct work you have to keep the noise within that duct, the more accurate results are gonna be. Because you're looking at the delta. Exactly. Okay. If you use very thin gauge duct work, a lot of that sound is gonna break out, enter into the lab and you're not actually capturing it in that comparison. We've gone to great extents and each piece of that duct work weighs like several thousand pounds. So right. you're gonna get some workout moving them in and out, but it's what you need to get really accurate results. Correct. And as you go longer and longer silencer, it's more and more effective. So we need this uh, duct work to be insulated so that uh, there's no flanking noise uh, coming in and out of uh, the inlet and discharge sound silencer under test. Now we're going to the uh, sound room. Thanks. On the one end of it, we saw how quiet it was in uh, near the fan. We're absorbing all that sound with the silencers and things like that. We want no sound entering on that and we're trying to take all that sound out. And if you guys follow me uh, into the reverberant room, we're gonna see kind of the opposite effect. You could probably hear it with my voice. It'll start to echo. I'm not sure if the mic will pick it up. But in the reverberant room, we're gonna to try to get a nice uniform sound value in here. Uh, the sound's gonna bounce around. We're gonna get a nice even uh, distribution in here. And we have a microphone that rotates around uh, to get a nice average sound value. This enclosure that we're in here, the reverberant room, is about 750,000 pounds of concrete. Uh, it's completely isolated from the rest of the building. It's sitting on about 184 spring packs like this. Uh, 183, I took one out. I'll put it back out here. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so it's completely isolated from the rest of the building. There's actually a step. So 
Uh, if you guys ever get the chance to come visit us here in Winnipeg, we'll point out there's a step and you can see how it's actually, there's a gap in the concrete. So it's completely isolated. And the reason for that is we'd actually hear um, the factory with the presses and things next door. We get to pick up some of that vibrations through the ground. Um, also, we have semis kind of coming in and out all the time, picking up product and shipping it out. Uh, so we'd also hear those semis driving by on the street. So uh, maybe I'll let Edgar add some more details yeah. to the space. Yeah. In addition to Steve's uh, point, we, this uh, room is about 21,000 uh, cubic feet or 610 uh, uh, cubic meter. And uh, so this room uh, is qualified to test uh, down to 50 hertz. So we can test uh, most of the standards requirements from 50 to uh, 10,000 hertz. This room is also qualified for both uh, the uh, discrete frequency as well as the broadband qualification as per ANSI S1251, ISO 3741, and the uh, HRI 220. Any questions you see around this uh, room? We get the... I've got one. Why, why couldn't you just use a mic in the duct? Uh, that's a good question. We there's a standard that's uh, using uh, there's a standard that's using two uh, two two mic uh, method that's an uh, induct. I think that's an ISO. I'm not uh, too familiar with that one, but uh, we're using the reverberation room method, which is uh, easily calculated from uh, sound pressure to sound power using our uh, reference sound source here, and that's what uh, the uh, most of the HRI uh, required for testing uh, HVAC products. Okay. Yeah, the room comes in handy a lot more than just silencers. We use it for testing like fan powered terminal boxes. We'll put it in the room and measure radiated noise and calculate sound power. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll also use it for things like hydraulic chill beams to measure like discharge noise, uh, diffusers, grills, registers, air moving devices. It's, it's very versatile and you kind of need that echoey reverberant space to do that. There's also the opposite of a reverb room is an anechoic chamber that's extremely absorptive, which can also be used for measuring sound. Um, we don't have one yet, but maybe one day. <laughs> what would be the purpose of that? A lot of measuring uh, like sound power of equipment. So you'd put a device in there and measure its actual raw sound power where none of the energy is reflected. It's all absorbed into the walls. You can get a really accurate measurement of how much noise a device is making. Uh, we do have some in the city we've used uh, in the past at like our research center at the university, but we don't have our own chamber right now for anechoic. And just a side note, Chris, we have also a research uh, uh, going on in HRI that we compare uh, those uh, three uh, different uh, standards such as HRI 220, for the uh, reverberation room or ISO 3741 and ISO 9613, I believe the uh, sound intensity or sound, uh, pressure, sound pressure. And then uh, we have also the ISO 3745 or 3744 for the anechoic room. And uh, they're really uh, in good uh, comparison to each other within uh, like a two to three dB. So that still ongoing in HRI as well. I think we had another question. How do you heat and cool and ventilate that room? <laughs> Good question. I don't know if anyone's ever asked that. I don't know if you could hear it here, but the gentleman asked, how do you heat and cool or ventilate that room? Is there any provisions for that? Not really that I've seen. Uh, that's a good question. We don't. Uh, we only test at the normal condition about the Winnipeg temperature. <laughs> so it's like 20 degrees. So we don't test uh, uh, like uh, below the normal temperature or the comfort temperature because we don't have a capability right now for testing uh, colder than uh, our uh, room temp. How do you do it? Like, do you get the noise from the system or what, what do you, that's what I'm wondering. The noise itself is generated from a speaker. So there's speakers that are broadcasted at a certain level and we sort of use that reference level to measure against. Are you, awesome. are you asking, I guess, in terms of conditioning the room, it's it's internal to the, the building and then the outside of the room is actually would be conditioned, but so you just you don't know, really we're, have not, a we're not getting any HVAC actually inside this room. 
Yeah. yeah. There's no no grill or anything providing air to the space other than the product being tested. But the doors are usually open unless they're testing, right? Yeah, and it's quite yeah, comfortable yeah. in there. I've never felt it like extremely hot or it's cool. Like a, it's sort it's of like a passive house. room temp, 70. Because <laughs> there's really, you know, up the concrete's like a, what, a foot thick? Yeah, eight inch thick yeah. concrete. Eight inch thick, yeah. Eight, eight inch thick. thick. And before we test uh, a product, we uh, recirculate yeah. the, uh, the air into, into the room. Wait, what's going on here? All right. Well, uh, I don't know if you had anything else you wanted to mention, Steve or Edgar, but uh, really appreciate you doing this live virtual tour. That was kind of neat. Our the, first time doing that. Thing, I was just going to add, Chris, um, there's an entire wall of silencers here. So we talked about we don't want any of that sound to come out of a duct and back into the duct and the test when we're running the test. We also don't want any of the sound in this chamber to go back out into the lab. Uh, and pick up that sound again. So kind of on this this entire wall on one side, maybe if you guys rotate over a bit, um, but from pretty much the door all the way back to here, there's an entire wall of silencers from floor to ceiling. And uh, that's just to make sure that none of that sound gets out into the space. Like tucked around the corner that way, right? Yeah, it's, yeah. it's tucked around the corner. Kind of tough to get in there, but it's, it's like a 20 foot long bank of silencers essentially. And we used to joke that we'd lock our summer interns in the room and see if they could find a way to get out, but it's it's very uh, silent. Like you can scream into that silencer bank, and twenty feet on the other side, you can't hear anything essentially. So these silencers work very well, not just for ventilating the reverb room as we kind of pressurize it with the duct, but uh, preventing any sound from getting back out into the lab. Question: Do you do any testing like different room materials? I mean, obviously. You know, how, how do you test that or is that a different? Sort of a different standard for like sound absorption properties of like fabrics or materials, foams. Um, but we have done stuff like that in there where you can apply it to like a surface, whether it's the floor or the wall and sort of broadcast sound in and measure how much is absorbed. Sound is a little bit fascinating like that. And Edgar is a bit of an expert as uh, you mentioned many different standards on ISO and ASDM and ANSI and yeah. Uh, a whole wide variety of sound testing standards. And we have two reverb rooms, actually. This is the larger, newer room, and we have another one on the other side of the facility for primarily testing air moving devices like VAV boxes. But, uh, they work very well. Awesome. Well, uh, I think we can kind of end it there, guys. Appreciate you logging in for the meeting here. And yeah, thanks a lot, guys. Uh, this is really great. Take a live look at the lab. Saves us uh, two flight. Yeah, we'll still send people up to the RCM, but uh, for this group, that'll work perfectly. So thanks, Stephen. Thanks, I do appreciate it. Yeah, no problem. No Thank problem. You Thank you. And thanks for coming by us. Great. Good stuff. So now I'm going to try and switch back here with us. That was remarkably painless. Technology-wise, it worked pretty well. Pretty good. I think we can, we can fix a few of the little hiccups. And just for... Completeness. We kind of started in this fan room and then we walked all the way down here into the reverb room. So you had a sense of the scope and scale and a pretty remarkable place to visit in person, but also uh, virtual. So thanks, Ray. So, can you just uh, a little bit in the weeds? So, can you make, can you use any fan you want as long as you've completely isolated it acoustically? I mean, or is that like you have to use this? ASTM fan and this ASTM silencer and so good question we're going to get into that a little bit in a couple slides here but the lab and the way that we've designed this was very specifically around that ASTM standard I mentioned on the previous slide sure we want it to be as perfect as possible in terms of our conditions to replicate getting that accurate sound data and, you know, when we proposed building this lab to Jerry Price, the owner of Price Industries, we sort of said, you know, we have an idea, we feel we need to build this to get the best data in the industry. It's going to cost us about a million dollars. Um, Price is a privately held company. Jerry Price is our founder and owner of the company and our president. And he kind of said, you know, if that's what it's going to take to get into this business, let's do it. We ended up spending about three and a half million dollars on building this lab because 
concrete's expensive and sheet metal and ductwork and lab measuring devices are expensive, but it was truly necessary to get to the level that we wanted to and that we are today leading the industry in acoustical testing. Um, so we did it, we did it the right way. We could have cut corners, we could have, you know, outsourced our testing to third party labs, but we needed a lab to do the development that we needed and wanted to do. And it, it really paid off over the last 15 years or so. One thing I didn't mention is I got a bunch of price swag here, some nice Contigo cups and books and stuff. And I'm gonna give this away to you guys on asking questions. So if you ask a question, um, maybe you're excluded. I don't oh, know. Man. Um, it's working you asked a lot of questions, so you're gonna get them all. But uh, <laughs> you'll get a price shirt. I've you. been there, so I suppose I <laughs> accept your ruling here. But I want you guys to ask questions. So can't see your name at the back, but thanks for asking a question about the temperature of the room and how we do that. And if you ask William as well. Yeah, there's a few, a few people have. Um, and if you're uh, online, you you're allowed to uh, ask a question. Raise your hand. You don't see anything in the chat. So ask, ask a lot of questions and I'll I'll give you tickets so and you can win free stuff. And if you're virtual too, we'll hopefully we'll somehow we'll get you stuff. And if I miss someone, let me know. We'll use on the other solely with the camera work. Okay, let's uh, let's jump back into things here. What do you guys think of the virtual tour? Was that cool? Kind of neat, right? All right, so I think you understand how the lab works and why we have it and this test center that we typically test to. Another thing that we've taken and we've gone to the next level on to really ensure that we're testing properly is that we have what's called NAVLAP accreditation. NAVLAP is a third party voluntary accreditation board that basically comes into our lab voluntarily. We pay them to come and check that we're doing things accurately. They do an assessment, they check our technology, our information management system. They actually monitor some of the testing reports and they check that we're doing it accurately. We're quite proud of that and we have certificates that we're testing competently to the latest standards that are involved with NAVLAP. Um, we have three different designations right now that ASTM E477 that I mentioned for testing prefabricated duct silencers. We also have an ISO and an ANSI designation as well for testing sound power, sound pressure of different devices. And we're really proud of this and we like to share this because noise control and silencers in general, as I mentioned earlier, are a little bit you know, smoke and mirrors and the data in behind the testing is important to be able to trust and know that it's going to perform accurately. One thing that is quite interesting, and this is actually a look at all of the different acoustic nav lab labs within the world, not just even North America. There's a couple in Japan, maybe in Europe. Um, if you look at this list, Something sort of jumps out at me that's interesting. And I don't know if you can see that in the back. Yeah, they have really good eyesight. It's like an eye test. But uh, does anyone notice anything with these different companies that are listed that have labs? Do you see any HVAC companies on there? Well, <laughs> Manville and Armstrong are in the ballpark, you know, There's There's some independent ones, I suppose. Yeah, so there, there isn't a lot of, you know, HVAC companies. I don't see Titus Kruger, Nailer, Vibroacoustics, IAC, Kinetics, Ruskin. Really, nobody has a NABLAP accredited lab in the HVAC product world. There's a lot of great companies, Armstrong, Ceiling Systems, Owens Corning Insulation, Riverbank, Intertech are third-party labs that do a lot of testing. But I found it quite interesting. Price is actually the only one currently with an active accreditation held for noise control testing and acoustic testing in general. Um, we do have a question in the chat. Yeah. From Dan, is every sound sir, tested before shipping? Good question. So the answer is no. We don't test every silencer before shipping it. It would be sort of infeasible. We ship, you know, tens of thousands of silencers and silencers are something that vary quite extensively. And we're gonna look at that in more detail throughout the morning here. But we test a wide variety of silencers based on geometry and configuration. 
And we've tested so many silencers over the last decade or so that we have a really good understanding of the matrix of data that comprises what we manufacture. And we feel confident that the performance data we have in our software and our catalog is accurate based on how they're going to perform. What I mean by that is that we build silencers of every shape and size from six inch by six inch up to 480 inches by 97 inches. They're completely customizable and dynamic in sizing. And we can't always test every single permutation of that. But we have done, you know, the big ones, the small ones, the mediums, and kind of extrapolated in between where needed. Um, for all of our product types, whether it's circular, elbow, rectangular. So yeah, hopefully that answers. And I'm not sure who that was or how I gave them a virtual ticket, but I will we'll keep score. I'll do that. Chris, I could write his name on a, a ticket for you. Yeah, let's do that. I'll hold that and then you can put it on there. Cool. Thanks for the question. Something that's quite interesting and I like to share as well is that fiberacoustics is one of our biggest competitors in noise control. They had a lab and they were testing products for a great deal of time. Unfortunately, they lost their lab and they were actually suspended from having their NAB lab accreditation and they no longer have a testing facility to test noise control products, which is sort of concerning a little bit because, you know, they're a big player in noise control and they don't have an active lab to be able to test products or develop new products. And they moved facilities and as part of that lost their NAB lab accreditation which could be an issue for them. Another thing I'll mention is that the test standard that we test you and that we measure sound against and we document and catalog all of our data is this ASTM 477 standard. I'm not gonna get into all the details of it today, but it's important that engineers, acquisitions, consultants, architects, contractors, owners understand that the latest version of the standard is the most accurate. And there was a revision done in the last couple of years. In 2020 was the year it was published, but it really didn't get adopted until maybe 21, 22, that manufacturers of noise control products should really be testing to this latest standard. And the reason for that is that the performance variations and ranges of what is deemed acceptable have changed. And this table is a little bit busy here, so we'll try and simplify it. But at the top is the last version of the standard. It was ASPM E477-13, 2013, so about 10 years ago. And what happened in that standard is there was a very wide range of acceptability on what we call repeat repeatability and reproducibility. It's a bit of a tongue twister. Reproducibility, repeatability. Anyways, get your kids to say that five times fast. Um, what was going on is that ASTM, through the governing body and a series of labs that were testing in conjunction with, with each other, found there was a relatively wide range of acceptable data. And these are in decibels of you know, 5 dB at 63 hertz, 2 to 3 dB at 125, and so on. What happened is that through round robin testing, which is basically a silencer gets built and gets sent to a bunch of these different labs, and the data that's captured is compared against the labs. And what was found is that 10 years ago, that range was quite vast. There was, you know, lab A would measure 7 dB, lab B would measure 12 dB, lab C would measure 9 dB, and there's a range of what's acceptable or measured. What's happened with the latest standard is these ranges and these areas have been tightened quite substantially. And this is a good thing because it shows that people that are testing noise control products and silencer catalog data should be accurate based on how it's captured and cataloged. There was previous versions of the standard as well back in 2007 and 1999 and 1984 and it goes all the way back until the 60s. As these standards progress and get reviewed and tested and retested, these typically get more stringent. And it's really important that manufacturers are publishing data to this latest standard. And we see all the time our competitors, other manufacturers, 
will have data that's listed to the 1999 version of the standard. And that data is very inaccurate. It's old, it's not, you know, as tight as it is now on this latest standard. So I hope that makes sense and it gives you some clarity on that. Well, sort of like, what's the point if you're off by it? I mean, three is not terrible, but five. Well, so re reproducibility means I take the price of silencer and I go over to Armstrong and I stick it in their lab. And we have a 16 decibel difference Correct. in insertion loss from one to the other. Correct. That's a pretty big deal. That's a big difference. But just taking it out of your lab and then putting it back in a couple of days later and you get a five, that's pretty big. Correct. Yeah, and now, you know, that five is now one, maybe two if right. you round up. Um, Usually you're driving around the two through five bands, not necessarily, but um, yeah. Yeah, and- Does ASTM have anything to do with your methodology for building silencers? Because I don't think ASTM cares about that. Not so much on the manufacturing of the product itself, more on how it's just the, lab the data is- calculated and captured and sort of today I feel like building silencers this way tomorrow I feel like building silencers that way yeah and unfortunately silencers don't have like an accredited rating program like uh what are the terminal units rating program HRI HRI certified or AMCA certified like louvers and dampers silencers don't really have that governing body it's up to the manufacturer to do things like all of the latest standard, use the NAVLAP accreditation. Um, and we truly do that. Like, I'm not just saying that as the general manager of this division, we've gone to great extents to really be a leader in this industry and educate engineers, consultants, acousticians that people need to do this properly because there's a big difference. And something that we've done is we've really gone and we've tested all of our silencers to this latest standard, ASTM E477-2020. That is really small, I apologize, but um, our specifications, our submittals, all of our catalog data was updated last year in 2022 to those latest standards. And as part of that, we had to retest and redevelop a lot of our products in the lab that you just saw, um, spending you know hundreds of hours of development time and building samples and making sure it's done accurately. Did you have to change the lab? The lab we did not, no. Um, thankfully, because we built it in a way that was already exceeding the standard with the ductwork being double walled, very robust with the chambers being concrete, uh, we did not. But others that lost their accreditation or don't have accreditation are struggling and they have old data now. Yes, question. Logan. Yeah. Um, did you get your accreditation with your new uh, lab or was it with your previous one as well? So both of our labs have the accreditation. Uh, we have an older chamber as well that still has the NABLAP accreditation. We also have NABLAP accreditation in a bunch of areas of our business, not just the noise control area. Um, we have a lab control division called Antec. They have NABLAP for their venturi valve calibrations and whatnot. But uh, yeah, both, both of our labs have it. And so if I'm Semco and I tested with an independent lab 20 years ago, and the, the standard changes. I just keep publishing the old data and I'm good. Good question. I'd be worried if I was them, to be honest, because engineers are starting to reject data that's from old standards. And I don't blame them because it's not accurate. So this really reflects when an engineer has their leading part of the specification and all those things that we never read yeah. with like, oh, the ASTM and the blah, 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 whatever that we all skip over. If someone knows what that is, they might hold the spec. Exactly. Okay. Or if you have specifications in your own offices or companies, update them to these latest standards. Don't have dash 73 on there because it's really allowing, you know, legacy manufacturers that haven't tested a silencer in decades to, to do that and sell product that doesn't work the way it should. Chris, we have another question in the chat. Okay. Does the acoustic media in silencers always in the vertical orientation? Good question. So for rectangular silencers, um, typically the acoustic media is in the vertical side baffles as depicted here. So these baffles on the side, 
contain acoustic media. It's really hard to do with them all, so I'll use this. Um, circular silencers, elbow silencers, other types of silencers will have media on all four sides or on the top or bottom. But it, it really depends on the type of silencer and, and where that acoustic media is located. But primarily on a rectangular silencer, it's usually only on the sides in the vertical. Does that keep pressure drop down or what's what's the reasoning behind it? Manufacturability is part of it. So it's a little bit easier to put insulation on the vertical. Um, the perforated metal that lines that baffle sort of is easier reinforced when it's horizontal or vertical like that. When you put it on the top and bottom, you have sort of the weight of gravity pulling down on it and it could cause like bowling. Um, but that being said, we do often add insulation on the top where you have very high insertion loss requirements. Like you need to absorb sound at a higher level, adding perforated metal on the top portions as well and bottom can be an option and use that on our STC rated silencers. You have to be careful kind of get a 30 by 30 sensor contractor will install it the wrong way then that could happen. Yeah, it, it does happen and we've seen that in the past, but often the way they're designed, the way they're built, it shouldn't be an issue primarily with rotating it, you know, 90 degrees. Um, get out there. I like all these questions. Speaking of this is good. Um, another one in the chat. Will the insulation sag over years? So the insulation we use, there's a variety of insulation. The primary insulation we use is a fiberglass acoustic media. And it's not like a loose fill fiberglass. It's not like a blown in fiberglass. It's actually like a long strand um, with a, a binder that uh, goes together with it. And the way we, go back to slide, the way that we insulate and install that acoustic media is it's sort of compacted under compression. It's not loose, it's not sort of underfilled, it's actually overfilled slightly so that that compression will help add to the insertion loss you can get. We don't see sagging of insulation as a common occurrence. Um, sometimes silencers are installed in areas that have high demands on them because of high air velocities or a lot of airflow or there's moisture or contaminants that might be present. In that case, we recommend media protection. And there's a wide variety of that that we're going to touch on, I think, in the next section. But uh, in general, it, it hasn't been an issue. We don't see a lot of you know, sagging of insulation causing problems. OK, one last point I wanted to make on acoustic data and performance is, have you guys heard of IMI acoustics? IMI is a little bit of a, a custom manufacturer of noise control products. They're located out in California, but they've been causing some noise. Bad dad joke in the industry. Oh, I like it. Because of their performance data. And they've got some really interesting attenuation factors and insertion loss performance that's been published. And a lot of the other noise control manufacturers, including some of my direct competitors, kind of got together and said, this doesn't seem right. Something's not right with their data. They have at the top here for comparison a 19 inch long, so you know, under two feet long silencer with this performance data published 31, 15, 18, and so on and so forth. For comparison, eight inch thick concrete has a comparable 30 dB at 63 hertz low frequency transmission loss or sound. I remember the lab. The lab, they don't have the new lab, it's plus or minus 16. You're on to it. Yeah. So for comparison, a 120 inch long, a 10 foot long silencer from price would yield these insertion losses. Again, 27 at that 63 hertz. So what the heck is going on there? And I've met with a lot of our competing industry partners um, at ATRI committees and these ASDM committees to kind of talk about, well, are these magic? Did they come up with something? Is it a new mousetrap? Well, unfortunately, they've been publicly called out for falsifying their test data. And what happened was Intertech, which is a third party NAVLAP accredited testing lab, actually published a report a number of years ago that said, if you see this 
data immediately stop using any product based on this falsified falsified report. And this is tough to see, and I apologize, the image doesn't come through super well on the screen. Maybe you can see it better in there. Actually, it comes up quite clear on the screen. Is uh, they had 14 dB at their 63 hertz, but they conveniently added that full tolerance range that was allowable in the previous ASDM standard, which uh, isn't really a good way to do things. You're not going to get 30 decibels of insertion loss. They basically took the outer range of the tolerance in the ASDM standard and completely applied it to their performance data and cataloged it. So, yeah, that's not what you should do. <laughs> It's uh, really giving you, you know, outlandish results. Okay, we're sort of on time here, and that concludes our first kind of section on the lab and some performance data in behind how silencers are tested. You guys want to take a quick break, maybe like a 10 minute? Why don't we hop back at 10, unless there's any other questions before we take a break? Going once. Okay. Yeah. See you all back here at 10. There's washrooms across the second floor foyer. And if the okay. we're back. Can you hear me okay? Audio is coming. Hey, through. you're doing good. Nobody has left from remote. I think the number right. is the same. <laughs> all right. Well, if you thought that first section was fun, this next one's going to get even more exciting. Oh, yeah. So we're going to spend a little bit of time looking at actual products. And I appreciate the questions about, you know, where does the acoustic media go? How does this work or that work? We're going to look at that in a little more detail. And we're going to delve into what I call, and this might be from Tom, demystifying silencer performance, where you guys know about the standard, you know about the lab now. Well, let's actually look at how these silencers are manufactured and why they work the way they do. We'll get into kind of the details around that. So in general, there's four main types of silencers or noise control products. And each of these categories or types have a specific reason for that. In general, silencers or sound attenuators or sound traps or noise control products, however you would refer to them, are selected based on the application. And depending on where they're getting installed, that's how you decide what type of unit is required. Absorptive, film line, tactless, and air transfer are the main categories. And I'll talk a little bit more on each of these four and what they are and why they're important. Rectangular silencers are really the most common practical type of silencer because a lot of commercial buildings use rectangular ductwork. They're quite simple. There's no moving parts. It's basically perforated metal and acoustic media in these baffles that absorb and attenuate the noise in a duct system. Often these are installed in large arrays or banks to build up you know, a bigger assembly. This individual component at the bottom here is essentially four feet by four feet to build up these large bank assemblies for things like generators or big air intakes. And that's quite common where individual rectangular silencers are nested together to build larger assemblies. Elbow silencers are similar to rectangular, except that you're now turning that air 90 degrees, where there's a radius kind of curvature, the internal geometry to obtain that directional airflow required. Elbows also work great where you don't have a lot of space. Rectangular take up a specific length of ductwork, and when you don't have a lot of space, elbows can be a great consideration. This is a good example of an elbow silencer. You can actually see kind of at that drop through the roof deck into the following ductwork here. A great place to attenuate the noise is as close to the source as possible while considering you know, your inlet and outlet conditions and system effects. In general, attenuating the noise right here is a great option because if you look downstream, there's a lot of keys and junctions and takeoffs that are going to transmit all of that noise that would otherwise be within the facility. That would be where that elbow is there. Let's see. Circular silencers are another type you may not be familiar with that are obviously great for round duct applications. And these ones have the acoustic media 360 degrees around that circumference. Again, they can be very large. This is about 60 inches diameter or very small, 
you know, four or five inches diameter, depending on what you're trying to attenuate. They're also great for large airflow and large air volumes. We build a lot of circular silencers that get close coupled with fans, whether it's, you know, a cook fan, a green heck fan, twin city fan, uh, whoever builds the fan. Silencers are often close coupled with fans, centrifugal fans, mixed flow fans, axial fans. And there's a lot of science that goes into that, depending on the hub diameter, the flange sizing, and so on and so forth. But they can be a great option to attenuate the noise directly at a fan. This is actually a, a green hack QEI fan that has an inlet and outlet silencer attached to it. In this case, we actually use the spiral duct casing to kind of match the rest of the ductwork in the system, kind of concealing it so it's not you know, an obvious noise control device. From a material standpoint, a construction standpoint, silencers use really whatever material necessary to match the connecting ductwork. And in general, when you're selecting or designing a system, if the system's made out of aluminum for corrosion or weight, the silencer would also be designed and built out of that same material. Um, stainless steel is often common for things like corrosive environments, laboratories, uh, fume hoods, where you're worried about corrosion or contaminants getting into that duct system. The material can really be varied depending on your needs, depending on your construction. Another thing that you can change, and this is often misunderstood, is that the casing exterior gauge can be increased. We call this the class of silencer, class one, class two, high transmission loss, high transmission loss two. And the idea around that is that the thicker the casing, the better the silencer is gonna contain and prevent that sound from breaking out into the area it's installed. What I mean by that, and this depiction here does a good job of explaining it, is that when you have noise within a duct system, that sound energy is typically gonna transmit through that duct down into wherever it's leading to, whether it's the supply or the return, that sound energy is gonna be transmitted easily through that duct into maybe the occupied space at the end. Another path for noise that's often forgotten about is that breakout radiated noise from the duct itself. And this can cause a lot of problems and issues. This is obviously fabric duct here and may not have the same concerns and this is distributing air in the space. But if you had a fan in a mechanical room on the other side of the wall and this was a thin gauge duct, that sound energy could cause a lot of problems in the space because it would otherwise be radiating into your environment. I think there's a question maybe on the chat here. Um, maybe I'll grab that real quick or maybe not. I thought I saw something. If you see something there, let me know. Um, maybe that was just a suggestion for questions from our remote audience. I don't know. <laughs> So in general, installing a silencer in this duct system could be a great option. You know, silencers are great at attenuating noise through the magic of PowerPoint animation. You can see that sound wave. It's pretty it's pretty I spent a lot of time making these slides. It's pretty, uh, <laughs> pretty awesome. And you can see as that sound energy approaches the silencer, a lot of that energy is dissipated and absorbed in those baffles and now quieter downstream of that silencer. Unfortunately, the placement of the silencer in this circumstance wouldn't really yield a direct benefit for that breakout noise. Moving the silencer closer to the fan, maybe inside of the mechanical room, would really help to achieve you know, optimal insertion loss, but also address that breakout noise concern. Isn't that cool what you can do in PowerPoint animation? The smaller sound wave now maybe not radiating and breaking out as much, creating a more appropriate space for this gentleman working here. I've had a couple of people really enamored with putting the silencer in the wall. Yeah, we've seen that quite a bit where it's actually like penetrating the wall or located like in the wall itself. Is there it's benefits any, in that? There's no like real benefit to that is there not really except i know you, except you got half the silencer out where you don't want it to be unless you cap it like right at the wall yeah but then you have a probably a life safety challenge because you should have a life safety damper, damper there yeah. 
we've seen it like in both places, either outside of the room, in the room, or spanning across the room. There's some areas that we see the need for it in between the wall, where you have very sound sensitive spaces, like uh, they call them skiff rooms or like interrogation rooms and military facilities where you're really worried about sound leaking out of the space where you want to put it at that partition to kind of oh like a an stc rated stc rated interrogation kind of a thing yeah there's actually there was a it was in the news a couple of years ago there was a court case that was jeopardized because people were talking in a space about a trial and sound and voices were able to be transmitted through the ductwork into the space and i guess I don't know, it seems like something out of Mission Impossible. They were listening at the ductwork and they could hear what was going to be whatever presented in the court case and it jeopardized the trial. And they actually, um, there was a whole bunch of news that came out on it that they had to like retry the case because it was jeopardized in the court offices. And uh, there were some standards that came out around that that if this wall is STC rated, like STC 50 rated, very high transmission loss. The penetration of the duct also needs to meet that equivalent STC rating. And that might be where you need a silencer of high um, construction class to be able to meet that. Chris, we do have two. Okay, questions. awesome. One is, can you roughly quantify the change in breakout noise associated with increasing duct thickness? by each nominal gauge type? Are we talking one, three, six, ten decibels? Good question. So there is actual mathematics in behind the class of metal or the gauge thickness of metal and the equivalent transmission loss. I don't have them in front of me here, but there's basically, you know, 18 gauge will give you XYZ transmission loss factors compared to 16 gauge compared to 10 gauge. And that can be used when designing or analyzing a different system. Um, you can also do that same calculation in our actual um, acoustic analysis program. And I'll show that in the next section where you can model you know, the gauge of duct and increase that gauge to see if it would yield better benefits. So it's not so much like a single number rating, there's different transmission loss in each octaband depending on the thickness. Um, the other question here. In my bracket. You need to observe the four duct lengths from the fan. Great question. So ideally, you would take that into account where you have, um, when you have a less than ideal duct element, whether it's a fan, a junction, an elbow, a transition, when you're looking at things like pressure drop of silencers, as we saw in the lab, silencers are tested to a standard under ideal conditions. A very long straight run of duct and that silencer goes in the middle. When you have a fan upstream or downstream of that silencer, the location of the fan is going to impact the pressure drop of that silencer. Chris, so you should, how time sensitive are you in part two? Because it might be worth just going online and pulling up the engineer, because that, that two pages in the engineering handbook yeah, it was really great. If you, if you feel like you can get through your presentation and yeah. hop on that. Like right now, do you want me to show it? I yeah, it. It's, yeah. Just, it's such a good visual. Yeah, let me let me just quickly do it here. I'm just gonna, um, I'm gonna stop sharing and then I'm just gonna quickly grab it here. I look at it all the time because I can never remember which side is worse, the inlet or the discharge. Yeah. Yeah, it's a great idea. I'll show you the best resource you can use for that purpose. Just gonna hang up on me here for a sec. <laughs> the 
I tried to hop on to share, but I didn't have Zoom link. We should be pretty flexible on time here too. So um, we're not racing against the clock, but we'll still finish on time. Okay, I got it here. So if I quickly share screen. So we actually have a really good engineering guide. Um, you can find it on our website. And what this shows and what it references is basically whenever you have a silencer installed nearby some sort of duct element, you want to try and keep that three to four equivalent duct diameters either upstream or downstream from it, or you need to apply an equivalent system effect. What I mean by that is that when you're selecting a silencer, I'll actually jump in here to our software. So if I go in and go to our silencer selection screen, and you guys may or may not be familiar with our all-in-one tool. When you select a silencer of whatever dimension, say 24 inch by 24 inch by 60 inches, the conditions in which the silencer is installed are one of the factors that you can actually select. They default to being ideal, which is basically three to four duct diameters of empty duct. So straight, unobstructed duct right before and right after. Which is never. Which is never the case. When it's not the case, you can do things like add a fan. If, it's, if there's a fan directly at the inlet, very similar to the PowerPoint that I had here, like this, you can select that inlet condition. And when you search for your silencer based on those parameters, it's actually going to apply that system effect pressure drop. And you can see that sort of here. Um, so yeah, I, I'd say you always want to be aware of that and sort of try and maintain those values when possible. But when not, when you can't, then effectively apply them when you make the selection. So you're allowing for those increases. When we schedule it then, do we factor? I mean, we probably should state system effect. I mean, I guess we put a schedule on their pressure drop, but you know, or should you put like ideal condition and system, put both on there so you know you're getting half of Ideally, that. yeah, if you had both. The thing that we see quite a bit of is it'll have, you know, 10 silencers scheduled and it'll have system effect pressure drop, 0 0.17, 0 0.12, 0 0.13. But then you're like, well, what are the system effects assumed? You need to know what they are. Is it an elbow? Is it a broad plenum? Is it a fan? If you don't have the mechanical drawings or the plan layouts and you just have the schedule, you're kind of missing one of the pieces of information. So it gets a little bit complicated like that. When they're scheduled with ideal, you can use that as your basis for your selection, but it's good to apply whatever condition is in place. Uh, Paul, I have my tickets here. Let me get, I think there was two ads on the online there. So I'm not sure who those were. <laughs> Thanks for helping me out with the, uh, <laughs> I'm going to throw the stuff out to you guys. That'd be easier than the tickets. Maybe. So a question got asked earlier about acoustic media, and this is sort of what it looks like in reality. And, you know, the fiberglass, I should have brought some samples maybe with me. I could have handed it around. It's a, it's a very robust, dense, sort of high density fiberglass that holds its form and shape quite well. It is very acoustically absorptive, but it is a little bit, you know, dense. It's not something that's like super loose and fibrous. It does have a binder that holds it together quite well. And that acoustic media is contained in this perforated metal chamber or baffle. We do also offer a natural cotton fiber acoustic media or a mineral wool. Mineral wool is very dense. It's got a very high uh, density and pounds per cubic foot rating to it, but it's also very uh, high temperature rating and moisture absorption properties are very low. It does not absorb moisture. So it can be used in sort of different types of applications or environments. One of the options we have with silencers is protecting the media. And we often use, this is a fiberglass cloth liner. And it's hard to see in the picture and maybe get a feeling for what it actually looks and feels like, but it's, it's almost like a satin feeling fabric, very tightly woven satin fiberglass cloth. And that's used when you're worried about shedding of media over time, or if you're installed right next to a fan under constant high velocity 
sort of exposure, it can help protect that media. We also offer a polymer film liner, and this is a thin polymer film that actually encapsulates the acoustic media to prevent it from being exposed to the airstream. So if you're working on a hospital or a school or some sort of food service or electrical manufacturing where you're worried about any sort of particulate matter in the airstream, the polymer film is a great option. One thing that we do at Price is Standard is we always offer this acoustic standoff, which is a thin acoustical spacer that actually goes between the perforated metal and that polymer film. And it works very well for increasing the insertion loss or sound absorption of the silencer. When you don't have that in place, the polymer film often just sucks up against the perforated metal and sound will propagate through it very easily. So it's a great option, and we do it on every polymer film liner as not an option. It, it comes standard. Has Price ever looked at getting some kind of a health grade certification for the fiberglass cloth? Because it's like if you look at it, it doesn't look like it's made out of fiberglass. No. If you touch it, like you can sleep on it. Yeah. It's, it's like, not like laying on a on a porcupine, like touching fiberglasses. <laughs> but you know, you give up so much with that um, polymer liner. Yeah, good question. So something we're investigating, and you might be the first public group I mentioned it to, is different types of acoustic medias. You know, fiberglass is the traditional acoustic media used in North America for the last 80 years. We're looking at alternative types that might be a little bit more green, maybe more environmental friendly, maybe more acoustically absorptive. In other parts of the world, like Australia, and we have a partnership with a company in Australia, fiberglass isn't used in buildings, in construction, in HVAC as much as it is in North America. They use materials like polyester. They're like uh, fibrous polyester materials that are quite high on the acoustic absorption properties, but are clean and don't have like fibrous, you know, itchy behaviors to them. So we're looking into some of that stuff right now. One of the challenges is the more North American building codes have stringent requirements on flame and smoke and the way they're tested for, you know, indoor conditions and buildings. Polyesters don't work well with flame and smoke. So uh, stay tuned. We're looking into it. There are some other materials as well. There was that blue jean push a few years ago. Yeah. That was quite a while ago. We still offer it. It's like a natural cotton fiber. It's basically recycled denim blue jeans. Um, it's cotton. So, you know, over time, cotton in the airstream may not be the most ideal thing because absorbing moisture or anything within there, um, it's a natural cotton fiber. So fiberglass still works one of the best for acoustic absorption properties. Packless silencers are a bit of a unique option and they work very well when you can't have acoustic media. So these are empty void metal chambers that sound waves will propagate into and then dissipate as they're entered into these chambers. We use these a lot for things like fume hoods, lab exhausts, um, anything with chemicals within it because you can't really have acoustic media in those chambers. We're actually seeing more of a need for kitchen exhaust of all things, where you have like a fume hood and, you know, grease duct. And if you're ever designing a system like that, those can be extremely loud. And when you're wanting to muffle the noise from a fume hood exhaust, silencers like this can be used when they have access doors and drain ports and cleanability that need to be built to a certain UL standard. There is a comment. Yeah. yeah. Another sticky item to consider with material selection, non carbon. We're hearing more and more clients ask about body carbon non construction material selection. Hmm. So I, I personally haven't heard that a lot, but it's really good to know. I know we're seeing a lot of interest in uh, like net zero sort of recyclability and what's the impact to the manufacturing process on materials, but embedded carbon is a new one for me. I don't know, are you guys hearing that or seeing that as well? Is that a popular thing? I am, but it's hard to navigate around embedded carbon because you need to get rid of steel and everything 
everything in our industry is made out of steel. It's a lot of steel and almost AI. everything. Interesting. I'll write that down because I appreciate you sharing it. I wasn't aware of it, but uh, good to know. So another area I just want to quickly touch on that you may not be familiar with that's extremely popular and we see a lot of interest in is air transfer silencers. So these are not ducted, typically low air volume, often on the return air side of a space where sound is able to easily transmit across an area or a building element on that air transfer side of things. There's three main types of air transfer silencers, the return air canopy or the rack, the return air silencer and the crosstalk silencer. And really the intention with these products is almost acting like a return grill accessory, a return grill silencer. So on the wall here, there's a couple wall returns, it appears. This is where those products would go in behind that diffuser grill sort of uh, air transfer device. Crosstalks are a great option where you need to transfer the air between two spaces without allowing the noise to also transmit through. There's typically an L, a U, and a Z shape that can be used for that intention. Something like this here. If you had a mechanical room with a common return, a crosstalk silencer would help to absorb and muffle that noise, but allow the air to still transfer installed between the partition. An RAS or return air silencer is another very common type. And these are typically four inches deep or thick installed behind a return grill. Again, the wall example is a good one where you have a sound source that would be annoying people within an occupied space and you'd want to absorb that sound energy. Or installed in a ceiling like that where the baffles of that silencer help absorb that sound energy that would otherwise be present. The final type of air transfer, which is really one of the most common that we see and works extremely well, is a return air canopy or a rack. And as you can see, it's basically a canopy over top of a T-bar ceiling grid open return. One of the added benefits that we hear, pardon the pun, and see a lot is that these completely black out the otherwise very open free area of those return grills. So if you have like a traditional acoustical ceiling tile like this, and there's an open A-crate type grill, you can often see directly in there up to the plenum, and you might see you know piping or plumbing or wiring or blinking LED lights from a VFD or something. Um, I kind of like that as an engineer. I often look up there to see what I can see, but owners and architects hate that. And with these, all you see is that black underside of that return air canopy that works quite well. I've seen engineers specify these field built sort of heavy gauge complicated boots with flex on them. And when you have a plenum return, it's all that extra stuff is kind of necessary because what do you, you know, you're, you're building an attenuator mm -hmm. and the benefit of building a heavy gauge, I mean, what are you trying to outperform here? <laughs> You're not trying to outperform the fan system. Yeah. You're just trying to outperform the acoustic tile that's next to the exact return air canopy. So, like making your plenum return transfer really robust is kind of a waste because you're still getting, so you're getting boiled down to what the quality of your tile is. So, if you got exactly. a crappy tile, who cares? And that's exactly how we've designed these. And I'll show you on the next slide on how I just we totally do this to you. I'm sorry. No, I, I thought you were done. I like that you mentioned that though, because that's where we see the benefit is often engineers and contractors will build like a field fabricated sound boot, which is like a little elbow or some sort of Z shaped connection. Uh, but like you mentioned, often you don't need that much attenuation. What happens in these spaces is that, well, let me go one more slide ahead here. So where would you typically see a return air canopy being used? I'll see if you guys are paying attention. An open plan office, a private office, or a gymnasium? Private office. Yeah. Ding, ding. So you need a ceiling, right? You need a return grill. A plan office or an open exposed ceiling deck or a gym, there's no need for a return air canopy. But if you're ever working in an indoor office with one of those common 
returns, consider that return our canopy. It works very, very well. Why does it work so well? Well, when you look at an office like this, what happens is these ceiling tiles and the same ones in front of us here are designed and sold with specific acoustic criteria. They either have NRC or SDC ratings, which is basically it'll have a sound absorption property or a sound blocking property. And people will go to great lengths to buy very expensive ceiling tiles, pressed fiberglass or mineral wool. But when you have a large open return drill put in, it limits the entire ceilings, what they call CAC, ceiling attenuation class. It makes this entire ceiling sort of a weak link because of that open return. What we've done is basically develop these products to either meet or exceed the same transmission loss to a fiberglass or mineral fiber ceiling tile. And you can see the return air canopy here, 8, 10, 11, and so on, is very similar to that of a fiberglass ceiling tile. So that putting that canopy over top of your return grill effectively makes it work similar to the surrounding ceiling tiles, like you were alluding to. Now, instead of some giant heavy gauge elbow, it's a very lightweight, low cost solution to increase your ceiling effectiveness. We talked about this a little bit earlier. Yeah, question real quick on the RAC. Is that uh, acoustic media on the underneath side of that hood there? Or is it? It is, yeah. So if I go back a few slides, it's basically, a, it's a sheet metal casing with fiberglass acoustic media underneath. Okay, and that media underneath, that's like black in color. It's, it's like black, okay. yeah, yeah. So uh, it's the combination of the fiberglass and the sheet metal give you that transmission loss. And uh, it also, with these overhanging wings, and we've sort of developed it so it's optimal size, it works very well for that intention. The other thing that's nice is that these snap into the T-bar grid very easily. So what we'll often do in our own offices at Price is, you know, Bob sitting next to whoever is loud on his uh, conference call or speaker phone, and you can hear everything he's saying, you can easily just pop out a ceiling tile, put this rack up, pop it into the T-bar grid and put the ceiling tile back in about two minutes. It takes you longer to find a ladder and get up in the ceiling than it does to install this product. There's no you know, complex assembly and they're very lightweight. You don't have to like reinforce it or tie it into the grid or anything. It basically just connects into the T-bar grid. So it's a great kind of retrofit if you're dealing with a problem. I used to bring these to presentations when we first released it, and I'd never go home with them because a contractor or engineer would be like, can I have that? I'm going to try it in my office. And they're very low cost too, so it's not like a huge investment to try. STC silencers are another type I just wanted to touch on quickly. And this is what I was talking about when you have like very high insertion loss requirements. There's acoustic media on all four sides, not just the side baffles with perforated metal often connected around. And these are used for things like I mentioned, interrogation rooms or extremely sound sensitive areas. The last thing I'll mention is just custom solutions. And we're gonna look a lot more at this later today, but we do a lot of custom silencers and often noise control is a reaction to a complaint or a problem. Don't be afraid to ask for something that's special. We do this all day, every day whether it's custom lengths or split to fit in an elevator or very high, you know, double wall casings. We do stuff like this and more complicated all the time, every day. The price doesn't have silencers sitting around. So I'll let people go, is it okay if it's a 61 inch wide? <laughs> yeah. Or 61 inches long or what? Like, yeah, that's fine. Like the, there are no standard sizes in Correct. That's a great build whatever point. you want. Everything we build is built to spec. We don't have stock we pull from. We don't build it in standard three, five, seven foot lengths. We build it to what's needed based on your parameters, whether it's you know within 0 0.01 inch increments. If you need it 14.72, that's what we build it at. So if you're running a pretty lean shop, you're gonna do all your prefab. Yeah, get get the silencer so you can get rid of a, a, a section of duct. Yeah.
Acoustic panels are another noise control product that I'll just quickly speak to, and we'll look at a lot of examples later this morning. And these are really kind of fun, customizable solutions around radiated noise sources. I mentioned customizable, and that's one of the beauties of acoustic panels. And Stephen and Edgar were in the lab earlier, and they had a little acoustic panel chamber there as part of our fan room. That's what they're used for, is really building up some sort of enclosure, barrier um, device to be able to mitigate noise transfer. Typically, they look like this, where they have a solid metal casing and a perforated or solid metal liner with a tongue and groove interlocking connection where they snap together very quickly, very easily. Something like this here, where you can build up an array or a set of them without uh, any issue. A lot of different options, similar to silencers too, different acoustic medias, polymer film, acoustic standoff, access doors, windows. I won't get into all the details, but very, very customizable. And usually what we do with these panels is stuff like this. We build up enclosures or barriers or some sort of combination of the two, where we provide it as a package with the base channel, the walls, the roof, the doors, it comes complete as a kit to install around whatever the sound source is. We do some very large acoustic panel projects, which I'll show you in the final section today, but also very small ones where, you know, Tom might have a residential air conditioning unit in his backyard, whatever the, the outdoor condensing uh, compressor, and maybe his patio is right next to it and it's annoying. Acoustic panels, great option, create a little barrier, we actually build a lot of that type of thing for people that have a beautiful backyard and their air conditioning. I saw Glash, had, or I saw Glash was featuring one. Yeah. Keith had one, yeah. Keith had one out in Seattle. Um, we get a lot of requests like that where I've got a generator on my boat and I want to build a little housing for it. Acoustic panels are a great option for that. Enclose it or block it or kind of a partial barrier of sorts. Are you seeing any return, you know, in the 90s, there was a lot of stick built air handling? We are. Are you seeing a return to that at all? Yeah, and I've got a few examples, actually. We were just on a job site in April that built massive built up air handler casings using acoustic panels. Okay. They were down in the basement of a facility where they couldn't really get a lot of access to. They had one freight elevator with limitations on sizing. We built the entire air handler unit replacement out of thin kind of acoustic panels that they could fit in the freight elevator and install over a weekend. So great option for that. So this section I'm calling demystifying silencer performance, which is a great word, by the way. I think I stole that from you, Tom, demystifying. But what does that mean? Well, my buddy Zach Galifianakis from The Hangover was demystifying how to count cards, I think, in this image, which uh, he's a great actor, by the way. And I often find people get confused with silencers and, you know, we get people rejecting our insertion loss performance because it's too high. The schedule will have six, seven, nine, and we'll have eight, 10, 12, and they'll say, no, nope, rejected. It's too high. It's like, well, that's a good thing. They're taking out more sound, but, you know, they see a, an excess value for sound and they're like, it's too loud. I'm going to take a few minutes and we'll go through this section, just looking at factors affecting performance and how silencers actually work and why there's so many different options and letters and numbers and things associated with it. In general, silencers are often seen as, you know, this smoke and mirror sort of thing. And this was actually in the lab that Edgar was just walking through with us where we've done a lot of testing and development on our baffles. And this smoke demo actually shows you why we have you know, a radius inlet, you can see that laminar flow kind of developing. And then this tail section where you get that static regain. This wasn't by accident. We spent a lot of time and effort doing CFD and building samples and checking angles and radiuses to really optimize the construction of these things. It seems kind of crazy. You know, silencers are pretty simple. They've been done for 50, 60 years. But we wanted to optimize all of these different variables to the best extent possible to make sure we had the best performing silencer. Going back to our lab that we learned about earlier, something you should know is that we test under ideal conditions. And you can see it in that 
silencer flow test here, that there's a long straight run of duct and that silencer goes in the middle where there's five equivalent duct diameters upstream and 10 equivalent duct diameters downstream, a very long, you know, 60 feet of duct, which never happens in practical installation. Um, space is tight in every building and you never have the perfect area to install a silencer. In general, we typically try and allow three to four duct diameters up and downstream, but even that is often a stretch. Sometimes you're close coupled, you have a junction or a fan or a takeoff directly adjacent to it. But ideally, trying to have you know a minimum of three duct diameters up or downstream is ideal. What we do is often apply system effects, and we talked and I showed the software earlier. And this is how that usually works. When you have a pressure drop with system effect, you take your ideal catalog pressure drop and you apply a factor at both the inlet and the outlet. In this case here, if this silencer was installed in this orientation, our ideal silencer pressure drop of this device would be 0.25 inches of water gauge. On the inlet side, we would have what we call ideal, a nice long straight run of duct going in. On the outlet, we have this mitered elbow. And the combination of those two conditions basically yield the inlet would be a 1.0 factor. The outlet would be a 2.0 factor, basically doubling the pressure drop to give us 0.5 inches of water gauge. And this is important you kind of understand that because when you're putting silencers in, a duct system, in this case, you're doubling the pressure drop of that device by having this hard right angled mitered elbow at the outlet. What you might do is just put an elbow silencer there. Again, elbows are great where you don't have a lot of space and maybe it's easier to have an elbow instead of a rectangular just next to the elbow. And then you're down to that 0.25 inches with an elbow. Ideal inlet, ideal outlet, and- I'll just blame the manufacturer, that's a lot easier. That works too. <laughs> we created a fun acronym to explain the factors affecting silencer performance. And there's even a kind of a badass looking flame. This is new. Have you seen this? I haven't seen this okay. before. So this is kind of new and I sort of created this as part of discussing content for this session today and Thursday. Oh, we should have done the, we should have done the, um, the game show here to, to guess. Oh, we could. Yeah, I mean, I'll throw out tickets if you guys can guess any of these. So F-L-A-I-M are sort of the five factors that affect silencer performance, some of which we've already talked about today. But does anyone have a guess? Like, what is F-L-A-I-M? A few of them are a little bit abstract. I wouldn't expect you to get them. But others, maybe you could guess at. Any guesses? Come on, you guys. The chat, maybe, too. Flow, length. Uh, oh, Nemo is going to be racking up stuff. Yeah, yeah some are a little bit hard. I'm not going to lie to you. Airflow. You did get length right. Length is one. I'm going to I'm going to say one. I don't think anybody would give aspect ratio. I don't think that's what I call it, but I think you're on to the right track. Mm -hmm. I don't think you're going to get it. So let me let me walk through them. And it's a fun acronym you can probably remember. Flame spelled incorrectly. There's no e. In Guesses in the chat. Is there? One is material, other is area. Yeah. Sort of. Um, I'll give you a, a ticket for trying. Uh, with rectangular elbow silencer schedules, what wording or note can this I use? It was remystifying silencer performance. Should be a high cue. So, good question from Ryan on the chat. What wording? <laughs> should be used to indicate the plane the elbow should be applied to. So at price, we often refer to elbows as either turning in the horizontal or the vertical, but this can often get misconstrued because some people say, you know, easy bend elbow, hard bend elbow, the throat, the neck, the inlet, the outlet. The best way to kind of ensure you get what you're intending is to kind of provide a sketch or lay it out or show it on the detail because we've seen you know the elbow needs to be 36 by 54 turning in the hard bend what does that mean 
uh, needs to be 36 by 54 vertical. It's like, is that going up or down? Or Elbows can be tricky when they're described in words and not in imagery. So I always recommend, if possible, providing a sketch or a detail of how that elbow needs to turn or be shown. So let's look at this flame crazy acronym I came up with and uh, try and see if we can understand the factors affecting sounds or performance. So the F is free area or open free area or free open area. And we use the PA code to describe that. And I'll explain what that means in more detail. L is the length. A is the acoustic media. So the type of fill or acoustic media. I is the internal geometry. And then M is the module width or the module factor. And some of these might be a little bit convoluted. What is PA code or module factor? But I'll walk through these with you and hopefully you'll leave this with a great understanding. So free area is a common consideration with silencers and extremely adjustable on all of our price silencers. Basically what it is, is the free open area or the air gap width on a silencer. And this air gap width or the opening of the baffles will range from about 20% to 60% on any silencer. This is what I'm talking about here. So you have baffles typically on the side and then this open free area in the middle where the air is gonna transmit through. That area can be adjusted. The tighter the gap, the smaller the free area, the bigger the baffle the more insertion loss you're going to get, but you're also constricting that airflow quite substantially. The wider the gap, the smaller the baffle, the less the pressure drop, but the less the insertion loss. An example of this would be something like this here. If you had a 24 inch wide silencer, the gap was 12 inches, what would the free area of that silencer be in a percentage? Any quick math? 50 or so? 50. Who said 50? Mike? Okay. Yeah, 50% yeah, per year. New math question. Oh, so this this is, good. I love this. This is kind of how you would calculate that. And again, it ranges, and silencers are very customized. Um, so you can have you know a 24 inch wide silencer, but you can also have a 20 inch wide silencer or a 16 inch wide silencer. They they change continuously. Every job every silencer is a little bit different. At price, we usually use these codes or these percentages to depict our free areas of a silencer. And you'll see this in our models. When we have an RL64B or a 4C or a 6D, that's what these are, is a percentage of free area. We use a code mainly because we don't want our competitors to copy us. I think they've all figured it out by now. We've been doing this for a long time. Everybody knows an A gap is a 57 and a half and a F gap is 25, but we use a letter to pretend we're scientists or something. That'd be like extended width silencers, an extended width. Yeah, so that gets used in there too, where you have like extended casing and that would factor into that as well. But in general, you know, this free area, 50% would yield a BPA code, pressure attenuation code, we call that. What is the purpose of this? Well. Silencers provide two things primarily, insertion loss and pressure drop. Insertion loss is a good thing. You want to take out sound. Pressure drop is a bad thing. You're obstructing the flow. You're creating back pressure. If you look at these letter codes and these colors, this graphical comparison sort of shows you what's happening. On the right side, this is our insertion loss. So 63 to 8,000 hertz your insertion loss kind of has this bell curve to it. And that's quite common. Usually low frequency and high frequency are kind of the lowest. And then that mid octave bands have higher insertion loss. At the widest open free area, an A code or 57 and a half has the, high, has the lowest insertion loss because of that wide gap, small baffles, low insertion loss. The pressure drop is also very low because you've got that wide gap, less obstruction, kind of less than a tenth of an inch of pressure drop. 
As you close that gap, 57, 50, 45, 37 and a half, 32, 25, 20, your pressure drop goes up kind of exponentially, you can see, but your insertion loss also goes up. So by playing with that free area, going from A to G, you've got a very wide range of options to suit your needs. Depending on your airflow, your duct size, your construction, you can pick your best gap code. Does that make sense? It's a bit of a convoluted sort of mystical code that we use, but that's the science behind it. And I hope you guys leave with a better understanding of it. Uh, we'll also have all these slides available if anybody needs or wants. Don't feel like you need to memorize this, unless you want to. Another factor is the length. You can change the length on any silencer, and this is usually an easy one, that the longer the length, it's in PowerPoint animation, right? Oh, cool. <laughs> As you change the length, you're going to get more insertion loss. The longer the silencer, the better it's going to perform. In general, they range from about 24 inches to 120 inches, but we've done shorter, we've done longer. All depends on what you're trying to do. Very similar, you know, a short silencer, in this case, 24 inches long, has low pressure drop, low insertion loss. As you get longer, your insertion loss is gonna go up, your pressure drop is gonna go up. Not as quick though, as that PA code. You can see it's more of a linear kind of growth curve than a parabolic. Acoustic media was the A in FLA, flame. Acoustic media has a huge impact on performance. Absorptive fiberglass is typically your best performing, cheapest, easiest silencer. Film line does degrade the performance, mostly in the mid and sort of high frequencies. In this example, it actually went up a little bit in that one 2K octaband, which does happen from time to time. Sometimes, depending on the frequency, you can get a little bit of a boost of performance with film line. But in general, it's quite a bit lower. And then packless, the no media, is by far the lowest performing, which makes sense. You're not acoustically absorbing it with fiberglass or anything like that. The I in flame, F-L-A-I, is the internal geometry. And this is something, again, we've gone to great lengths to develop one of the best options in the industry. We've got three different baffle geometries, and you can see it if you look at the angle of these baffles here. On the left, we call this our RL, or they're parallel baffles. In the middle, this is our RM, or it tapers at the tail section. And then on the right is the RH that fully tapers across the length. And it's a little bit hard to see because these are truncated for the screen size, but this has a big impact on the performance. What it does essentially is allows air to transmit through a completely sort of parallel baffle, tapering on the outlet or fully tapering. And again, pressure drop and insertion loss will vary depending on the type you pick. And you can imagine continuously changing this from a parallel baffle and also the free area, you can really fine tune these silencers to give you a wide range of performance. If you use like the RH, you're gonna have low pressure drop. If you use the A gap or that 57.5% free area, you're also gonna have low pressure drop. So it's they paired together. The final factor is module factor. And this one's a little bit convoluted, so I'll try and make it explicitly clear. But basically, there's different module factors that can be applied to a silencer. And these modules have different widths. And the width range is depicted with a number or a letter. Because again, we're magicians using magic numbers and letters. We want it to be sort of sneaky for our competitors not to be able to copy our designs. So, for example, a six module factor would be anything that falls between 23 and 24.99. So if this silencer was, say, 24 inches wide, a six module factor would work well in there. If this silencer, the component width or the bank width was 24 inches wide, 
what would my module factor be if this was 24 inches wide? Any guesses? Three. Oh, two. Sorry, one. <laughs> one. Right? One. You got to find me there, yeah. So if this was 24, 12 would be your module factor because you've got two of these module widths at 12 inches. What if this was 36? What would that be? Three. Three. You said that. Okay. So again, it's a little bit convoluted. Chris, when you build the silencer, are you building it? You know, I see like you could take the top one and overlay it on the bottom one and you'd have the same thing. Do you ever build it with bullets? We do often, yeah. So the top one would be called a one module factor. One there. Yeah. He gets one too. You both you guys will have. Yeah. Um so the, the top one would be called a one module silencer. The bottom one would be a two module silencer. Not the module factor, just the number of modules. So we would often build units like this where they have a center pod yeah. or a center baffle and then two side baffles. We'd also build them with three. Um, so theoretically, three that, shouldn't, that shouldn't change performance because you've got the same amount, whether you built it in two sections or one big section, it shouldn't change the performance, should it? It shouldn't. In and practicality. It, and it doesn't. So like, it, for example, if this was 12 inches wide, and this was a 12 module factor, the one, yeah. and this was 24, and this used that same one module factor, these would perform equivalently. It would be the same overall spectrum of sound attenuation, because you'd have just two of those modules in one. And Sort of the combination of all these things I just went through, the F, the free area, the L, the length, the A, the acoustic media, the M, no, F, L, A, I, the internal geometry, and the M, the module, all play into how silencers work. So there's a lot going on there. And this is how our model codes actually break down. Are you guys familiar with price silencer models? I don't, I don't think anybody, even us, like I, I know the model numbers, but I'm like, uh, I don't know. So that's that's what this means. And this would be a typical price silencer. If I actually just quickly switch over to here, you see in our silencer selection screen at the right here, I've got RM66A, 6B, RH. That's what all this means is the stuff I just kind of taught you there, the FLAIM. At the end of the day, who cares? Because we should all be looking at the insertion losses and the pressure drops. Exactly. This is really what matters. That's how we got there. And that's why there's so much variability in the performance is you can change all those different factors, all those different devices. So are you, so there must be some. Is it for, how do you, you don't have a test for every silence, right? We don't, but what we've done is we've tested all these module factors. So if you can test the module and the geometry and the acoustic media and the length, you can build a database that gives you confidence in what the performance will be. So again, Silencers are available in really infinite dimensions from six inches to 50 inches in any 0.1 inch increment. What we've done is we've tested all these different module factors to give you, you know, that range of performance within those widths. And it really, it, it works well. Um, all of these things I just went through kind of break down into that silencer model code. So the RL is that low velocity parallel baffle type. The length is that 60, that would be 60 inches long. The one would be that module factor. In this case, that would be a 12 inch wide. And then the PA code in this case would be an F or 25% free area. So when you see this RL 61F, that's what it is, is these different factors and modules and lengths and acoustic media types. So. A bit convoluted, but hopefully that gives you a really good understanding. On let me ask a question. There is a question in the chat uh, regarding acoustic media. Media, 
How frequently have you had warranty claims or concerns with damage to the film lining? What have you found to be the effective service life of the lining? Are there this anonymous applications? <laughs> so good question. And honestly, if you like knock on wood, as they say, um, we haven't had a lot of like failures of the film lining. We do use a relatively thick polymer film that has really good properties for service life and things like uh, shrinkage due to temperature and abrasion and tensile strength. Um, and we haven't seen like failures of the lining. Um, the lining we use is also like flame and smoke rated. It's used in commercial applications for things like what we use it for. Um, but we haven't really seen a lot of like warranty failures of it. Um, in certain applications where we're really concerned with like life safety or we don't know for certain if there's going to be exposure to certain chemicals, we would recommend packless like surgical suites or uh, like a laboratory exhaust that might have a chemical that's corrosive. We typically lean more towards the packless and the fill line. But we sell thousands of film line silencers and really haven't had any sort of specific failures around it. Couple of questions in here. Yeah. I'm curious, Chris, when we when we see extended casings and we're still trying to match duck size, and it seems like well, 99% of the time is to meet somebody else's insertion loss, or I think that's what we're looking at, right? So we make our modules bigger. Is that what you're doing there? We're, yeah, we're essentially. See if I can. I don't have a lot of details on extended casing in here, but what happens with extended casing is that the duct connection will remain the same. So let's say this is 12 inches wide. The extended casing basically adds six inches outside of the duct connection on the top and the bottom or the sides in most practical installations. Is it always six inches? It's always six okay. inches, yeah. Unless we do it as a special, and we've done others, we've done three, we've done 10, but in general, the standard extended casing option adds six inches to the casing. And uh, what that does effectively is that it adds a lot of acoustic media and sound absorption outside of that duct connection. So your baffle can essentially grow and absorb more sound energy than what the duct size would typically allow. And you usually get a lot of low frequency attenuation with that extended casing because your baffle has grown from maybe if this was a 12 inch wide silencer, that might be a three inch wide baffle. It's now grown to be like a nine inch thick baffle, a lot of acoustic media there. So that's kind of what it's used for. Okay. Is there another question? Yeah. No, obviously the extended casing is just going to be on the side with the baffles, but in a situation where you have baffles on all four sides, can they do extended casings? You can, you yeah. Do six inches? Yeah. So again, the top and bottom media is more of a special thing. You can't do that directly in the software. We do provide it a lot, though, and we call that like um, a rectangular cladded silencer where it has acoustic media on all four sides. And there's two reasons that we'd often do it. One is for adding to that outer baffle performance. The other is just encasing the casing itself in more transmission loss when you're worried about like breakout noise. So sometimes it's perforated on the top and bottom to allow sound to be absorbed. Sometimes it's not, it's just solid metal. And it really depends. And usually it's more of a custom thing when you're worried about really high levels of attenuation. I won't get into all the details on circular, but we do the same stuff with flame on circular silencers where the center body will grow and shrink. The length can be adjusted, the acoustic media. There is packless circular options available. Um, the same parameters sort of apply where you're balancing insertion loss and pressure drop. The more sound you want to take out, typically the more pressure drop you're going to have to deal with. Hey, that kind of concludes that section there. Uh, 1103, so we're kind of where we want to be right now, which is good. You want to take another 10 minutes and then- uh, well, We started uh, 10 after, so it's like seven minutes. Okay, sounds good. Let's take a, a quick break and we'll jump back in here and wrap up.
<laughs> Mute? Okay, I think we're good. All right, let's jump right back into things here. So the last kind of section here is going to be around acoustic predictive analysis and then rolling right into some unique examples and solutions that we've used this tool to be able to predict as well as provide over the last little while. Um, has anyone used price acoustic analysis? A couple nods. Okay, a couple shakes of the heads. Well, it's a tool that we've developed to be able to basically model HVAC acoustics. And it's a very powerful tool that we have thousands of users doing this day in and day out to be able to model and design projects around. Um, I'm gonna do a quick demo today. I won't have time to get into you know, a lot of specifics around every application, but it's extremely customizable to suit your needs on indoor, outdoor, supply, return, radiated noise paths. In general, when you're looking at acoustics, the different environments that we work in, that we get entertained in, that we get operated on in, have different acoustical criteria that needs to be maintained. And what I mean by that is there's background sound levels that are appropriate depending on the desired use of a space. Boardrooms and offices need to be at a certain threshold of sound or they're somewhat unusable. And depending on the properties within the space, the materials, the background sound levels will differ quite drastically. We often describe spaces using terminology dead or alive. Alive being highly reflective, dead being highly absorptive, where most spaces kind of fall in between those, like an average type space is quite normal. What would you call this? This is probably like medium live. Um, High ceilings, a lot of hard surfaces. Not much carpet. The actual fabric on the, the vertical surfaces of this helps a lot, I would imagine, where sound and speech is sort of somewhat absorbed, but you can hear an echo. Like, there is some reverberation time there. And reverberation time is something we use to depict and determine how reflective a space is, which is essentially how long it takes for a loud sound to dissipate 60 dB. And usually you want it under one second to be sort of used for a space like this. Is it under one second? Likely close to. The basics of noise control and what myself and my team do a lot of is basically break a problem down into its elements. There's a source of noise, a path, and then a receiver that needs to be sort of understood when you're doing or performing an acoustic predictive analysis. Some situations are quite complicated. There's multiple sources, multiple paths, maybe multiple receivers. Others are quite simple where you have one air handler feeding down into one space. Depending on what you're concerned with is what you primarily focus on when collecting data and information for acoustic predictive analysis. There's many different types of path, structure-borne, airborne, duct-borne, depending on, again, what's in place. Traditionally, when an acoustic analysis is done, the engineer, the owner, the architect, the acoustician would gather information on the source, the path, and the receiver, and then tabulate and calculate what you would yield for that background sound level in a space. This can be quite cumbersome. And I've done this over my career where you numerically collect the information and then mathematically average and deduct your path from your source. In this case here, we have an air handler unit and we have the sound power on the inlet side. You usually need those eight octavans to be able to analyze that appropriately. From there, we deduct the sound levels and values depending on the path elements. And traditionally, this is done using handbooks and ASHRAE applications handbook or publications that publish how much sound absorption different things would have. You would then have your room. And again, is it live? Is it dead? Is it acoustically absorptive? To yield your summation. Well, what do you do with that? Usually, what a person would do is calculate the sound pressure level within that space 
and then determine if it is appropriate or not. In this case, if you called me and said, hey, Chris, my room is at 69 dB at 63 hertz, 72 at 125, 74, 250, I'd probably be like, I don't know, okay. Um, what does that mean? Well, usually we take that and we graphically plot it on an NC curve. In this case, you would take those individual sound pressure levels down here, and you would plot them on this NC chart to get a noise criteria value or an NC value. The way that's done is the highest curve that's crossed on this NC chart, which looks like it would be around here, would set your NC value. In this case, we're actually around NC65, which is quite loud. If we wanted to get down to NC40, you have to reduce each of those octobands down an appropriate level to get to that NC40 curve. In this case, this would be the net negatives you would need in each of those octobands. And this is where we get our insertion loss values. You need a silencer with those insertion loss values to hit NC40, which is kind of tying together everything we've learned today is that if you look at a schedule and these are the values that needed, that's often how they get determined. It's looking at an acoustic predictive analysis to get down to NC40, you need 2, 15, 25, 20. You asked a question earlier, like, well, what if no manufacturer can meet these? What if there is no silencer at 25 or the length available doesn't have that? That happens all the time, unfortunately. Consultants will say, I need 20 dB at 63 Hertz. It's like, well, most silencers aren't gonna get that in three foot length, um, but it's the starting point of what's required to get there. What we've done and what we have available is a really powerful software that allows people to do this. You don't have to use handbooks and cables and Excel. You can use the software tool, the acoustic analysis software to be able to analyze sound paths. It's not a new tool. We actually developed it back in 2014 almost 10 years now it's been out and available. We also offer a complimentary service, which we call our acoustical lay-in design assist, which we can help you with this. If you're working on a school and you're worried about sound levels, loop us in, let us know what you need. We can help you analyze that. We've got thousands of engineers and consultants using our tool, and it's very clear and concise and accurate for this purpose. It also has no cost or licensing required, which is one of the benefits that you can download it directly from our website for free and use it today if you're interested. It's a pretty slick tool. I'm gonna to quickly kind of walk through it with you, but uh, essentially this is kind of what it looks like where it's a desktop-based analysis tool that allows a user to model these sound paths in this vertical kind of nature. Taking you know, a typical mechanical plan drawing, gathering that information on source, path, and receiver, and then populating it into the acoustic analysis tool is a, a very common workflow that we see. From there, you can generate detailed reports, acoustic analysis reports, product submittals, or specifications to kind of suit the needs of whatever the project you're working on. Can I tell you what I use it the most for? Yeah, sure. I, I'll just pull out the we'll stick the sound power levels onto the NC curve and just go, oh man, this is going to be tough or oh, this is not even an issue. Because I see you see sound power levels in the mid 80s and you go, I need a silencer. Is it loud? Yeah. <laughs> or I don't know, maybe I don't, you know, but just just to give you an idea of like how tough of a problem have you got if your gap, if your duck run is short and your gap is 30. You get yeah. some work to do. Yeah. You know, you're going to need a silencer. And, and then see, shoot, send it in. We see that all the time is you don't have to do the full path analysis. A lot of people use it for a quick DBA calculation. You know, what is this sound spectrum in a single number? Is it 100 DBA or 84? Um, or comparing, you know, fan A versus fan B. Or looking at duct design. Will this duct path lead to my result or not? We've got a lot of users of this tool, some of which may be firms that you guys are familiar with or work with today. Um, we train and onboard a lot of acousticians across North America all the time. And uh, we're looking for new users and we're constantly kind of showing the benefits of our tool. 
There is some other tools out there. I'll just quickly mention Dynasonics and Potter have had a tool. It was a great tool, actually. I used it myself years ago. Unfortunately, they discontinued support of it back in 2019, and it's really no longer active or current. There is people still using it, but you can't update it. You can't onboard new people for it. Train has a tool, Train Acoustics Program. It's actually a decent tool as well. I've used it in the past. It's a little bit quirky, and the user interface kind of looks like it's from 1995, but uh, it's also expensive. It's about $500 per license per user, and you have to buy an annual service fee as well. Fiber Acoustics has a tool called VA Design. I haven't personally used it, but I know a lot of consultants complain to me that it's a web-based platform where you have to log in to their network and their server to gain access to it, which certain people are concerned with, where you know you might have an NDA on a job or intellectual property you're updating, not on your own file servers, it could be an issue. And then finally, price acoustic analysis is, in my opinion, one of the best that's available. Um, it's free, it's accurate, it's easy to use, and uh, we've got great support in behind it. We've also developed it in-house at Price. We have a, a team of software engineers and developers, and we constantly improve the tool based on feedback we receive. Acousticians are quite picky people, and they like things a certain way, and we try and accommodate them when they bring things up that they don't like. Um, I'm actually going to jump here over to the tool, and let's just take a quick look at it here. So I'm going to show you two quick things. So the first thing I'll mention, I think the screen's following me, yeah. If you don't have it and you're interested, if you go to our website, priceindustries.com, you can actually download it very easily. Resources, software, and it comes up under our all-in-one for engineers software. So if you see this uh, price all-in-one software for engineers link, if you click on that, you can basically download it directly to your desktop. It's a great tool, not just for acoustic analysis, but for performance calculations, product selections, and my favorite acoustic analysis is within the price all-in-one for engineers tool. The first time you bring up the tool, it looks something like this here. As I mentioned, you can make product selections and performance calcs and look at different things on the product side of things. You can also do acoustic analysis, which is what we're gonna try and look at here. It might be a little bit slow just because I'm on the screen share and the Wi-Fi and uh, whatever else is going on in the background, but it's it's really quick when you're working off your own machine without all this other stuff going on. There we go. Okay, so when you first open the screen, it looks something like this here where you've got a lot of different things kind of going on across your screen layout. The first time you open the software, this info overlay will display, and you can actually see a nice little summary of what's going on. So at the top, you have all your ribbon tools, very similar to like Excel or Word that you'd be familiar with. In the middle is where your design space happens, where you actually build your path analysis. On the right are where all your properties are entered. The bottom right has a sound pressure level graph, and then finally, at the bottom left is kind of a summary of all the information. Typically, when you create a path analysis, you start with your source. And by clicking on your source on the right side of your screen, the relevant properties for the source start getting populated here. Um, I'm going to walk through just a simple one to start. So you can name your source. We'll call it Air Hunter Unit 1, Peg, 1, 2, 3, ABC, Notes. What kind of air handlers are you guys familiar with? What's a good air handler? Anyone? What's a noisy air handler? No one? No votes. Okay, I'll just pick one up. We'll call it Trey. I don't know. Trey make noisy air handlers? Mm -hmm. I got no allegiance to any air handler manufacturers. We'll call it Trey. Um, you can put in your CFM as well. I'm just going to use a very low CFM to start our analysis here. And let's pretend this is on the return path side of things. Typically, what you're trying to do and where you gather your information is from the manufacturer of that equipment on their spec sheet, their cut sheet, their website. You're going to need those eight octave bands of sound power level 
to be able to start your analysis. You'd be amazed how many times we get requests for, hey, price noise control, can you do an acoustic analysis for us? Here's all the info. And they send us 100 PDFs and there's no sound power data. So the one probably single most important thing is we need to know how loud whatever the device is you're analyzing. I'm just gonna quickly switch back to the PowerPoint here to kind of give you uh, a look at the path we're gonna to analyze today. You guys may have seen this in the past. I've used this one for quite a few examples, but it's a very simple way to show what the tool can do quickly. And it's a pretty common situation. You've got a rooftop air hunger unit uh, supply duct down into that classroom. So we've got you know an elbow, a straight duct, a junction, and then the classroom space itself. So let's quickly model this guy, and I'll show you some of the features that we have available here. Um, I just realized I put it under return. Let's actually put it under supply. Any like background music while I type in data? Okay, so there's my supply source. One thing you can do is uh, manipulate your graphs. Tom mentioned he often like looks at the sound pressure level graph or your DVA level. You can do that quite easily to see, you know, where do I stand? Um, you can also break these out and pull them to another screen. I use two monitors at my desk. If you have two monitors, you might want to set this up accordingly or collapse or expand them as needed. Um, from there, you actually build your path. So elements are available in the software that are all kind of pre-populated, referencing all those industry standards we talked about earlier, like ASHRAE. For the first one, let's pick an elbow. If we have an elbow duct, we'll use an unlined rectangular elbow, and we'll say it's 24 inches by 24 inches with that 1,000 CFM. One of the really nice things with the software is it pulls information forward from the previous element. I put in a thousand CFM, that elbow element knows that it was a thousand CFM and it's going to continue through in that nature. The next element I'll pick is a straight duct. In this case, again, all those dimensions are going to get pulled from the elbow 24 by 24 and I'll put in 20 feet of straight duct. Something you'll see is that as the path populates, these different elements are giving you those deductions based on the size, the material, the configuration, all of that information is actually coming and is referenced in this help file at the top. If you go to the help file, what it's going to do is it's going to give you all of the references of where all the data is coming from out of the software. Although we developed this tool at price, most of the information contained is from the governing bodies in the industry, not price industries. It's coming from ASHRAE Applications Handbook, Fundamentals of Noise Control, and so on and so forth. There's a lot of different references and great data kind of in those tables if you're interested. Um, as we keep building our path here, we're gonna to get to the end of that kind of dock and we'll have a, a junction. Again, if you're not familiar with junctions, there's a lot of great information in here. You can click on things for detailed descriptions. It'll show you different types of junctions, how these all work. In this case, this kind of looks like what we're gonna do get to that end of the hallway and it's going to T junction into that space. Go back here, we'll use that T junction and we're going to say it goes from 24 to eight inch diameter. What's that? Okay, we've got that junction and let's add another piece of duct work. In this case, we'll say it's a unlined circular duct. I'm going through this pretty quickly, obviously, for the sake of time, but you can see building these path analysis, it's quite easy. You basically pick through pre-populated elements and you apply your, uh, your properties as needed. Um, at the end of our duct, we're going to have something called end reflection, which is basically that eight inch diameter duct coming to an abrupt end. And then some of that sound energy reflecting into the space and some reflecting back into the ductwork. Finally, we're at the room itself, which is our receiver at the bottom. And at that point, we can model the classroom space. So in this case, again, modeling the size of the room, if you wanted to do 
like a theater space like this, you could do that with uh, the size, width, depth, height, average distance to receiver. We'll say five feet as in someone sitting directly below the actual diffuser. And then you can say, you know, what is this space constructed of? Again, is it live? Is it dead? We're going to use average maybe for a classroom. Once you get down to that, it'll ask you, what is your criteria? And this is important. So what do we want the background sound level of the classroom to be? If you're not familiar, there's actually a great reference from Asherah right here. Um, classroom, that sounds good. Let's click on that. NC30. At that point, we've kind of done a very speedy acoustic analysis example. What I'll usually do is start by looking at the sound, power, sound pressure level graph and seeing where we stand with respect to NC30. In this case, it looks very loud, NC56, right at that you know, 1K, 2K octave band. And there's a few things you can do at this point. Maybe you want to try a different air handler. Maybe you want to try and line the ductwork. Maybe you want to try and add a silencer. You can do that very easily. And what I'll often do is I'll actually just copy that path so I'll leave my initial path and I'll create a copy of it to kind of play around with instead of maybe messing with my main one. Um, and let's call this silence path. What you can do at this point is you can take your path and sort of look at it. Maybe you go back to the mechanical drawing or the actual thing that you're analyzing and say, well, where could I attenuate this? Maybe I'll put a silencer in here. What if we try and put a silencer directly at that elbow and see what that looks like? Let's try that. So the elbow element I had here, let's actually try and disable that. And rather than using an elbow duct piece, we're gonna go into that middle section called noise control duct silencer. One of the powers of this acoustic analysis software is that you're actually in, click on it. You're actually in the all-in-one software, which is where all of our silencer selections can be done. So in this case, if I want to pick an elbow silencer, you might have to configure it a bit the way you want it. Let's make it vertical like that. Maybe shorten it up a bit because I don't have a lot of space. Uh, make that inlet leg a little bit shorter that's dropping down. And then what you'll see is that all of the information from the acoustic analysis, including the unsilent sound levels and our criteria got pulled over here. So we're kind of ready at this point to hit search. Maybe you wanted a certain material, you wanted aluminum or something like that. You can also make that selection at this point. But in this case, let's just hit the search button and see if we can find something that applies enough insertion loss to get down to NC30. So this third one down here, again, Looks like NC30 with low pressure drop, looks pretty good. If you look at the model codes again, that ERM 966A, you guys got a good understanding of what that is now with 96 being the length, ERM being an elbow, and then 6A being that pressure attenuation code and module factor. If I just double click on that element, it actually pulls that silencer back into my analysis. And through sort of the magic of, um, pre-determining what I wanted for values, it worked out quite well. You can see on our sound pressure level graph here, the green curve is now that elbow silencer insertion loss applied, dropping below the NC30 curve. Um, any initial questions on that? I went through it very quickly, but I think you guys are following me here. I think the takeaway is if you want to try it, you can use it. It's pretty straightforward. And if you want to have airflow and price give you a hand this is basically what we're doing it's there's no there's no real secrets when we send you a file you can open it up and see what's been done and that's one of the really nice things that you can do with this tool is so uh maybe let me delete this path there a factor like the flexible duct in there you know i get the lining in there but i'll flex duct there is there. yeah so if you had like say say this duct here was actually flex duct. Um, at the bottom here, you can have either a lined flex duct or a whole bunch of different types of duct. Um, you can also do things like duct liners. If you have a one inch or a two inch duct liner. Another thing I'll just quickly show is that we have a lot of acousticians that use this program and acousticians, acoustical engineers are quite 
specific with what they're recommending and analyzing. What a lot of large acoustical consultants will do is they'll have handbooks and tables and data that they've used for generations. And you can actually go in and say something like um, a flex duct that has a liner. If you don't like the values that are coming out of here, you can actually override them. You can go in and say, no, this is too much high frequency. I want to cap it at 20 dB or whatever. You can go in here and uh, define your own. And we see a lot of users do that. Another thing that you can do that's quite powerful and a lot of kind of power users will do is you can actually create and save custom elements. So a lot of acoustic consultants and engineers will do like they'll use the same VAV box for every job at the same airflow. You can save those top five boxes with their discharge power level, sound power levels, and add them into analysis very easily. Or the same diffuser or chill beam or piece of ductwork. And we get a lot of people using those custom elements a lot. That's one thing that's really not in there is VAV boxes. They, they're not really a sound generator but they are yeah it's so there's a project we're working on behind the scenes to see if we can grow this tool to include kind of all price products um, or any manufacturer's products so if you had you know right now in the middle section it's got noise control products but what if you wanted like fan coils or blower coils or fan powered terminal boxes or diffusers or whatever, um, we're looking at how you could do that. And part of the problem is for the program to work accurately, you need all eight octave bands of sound level. A lot of VAB boxes only use bands two through seven. They don't use one and eight. So you're kind of left with some um, missing points. But uh, yeah, once you've done this and you've created an analysis, you can also generate a really nice report. Um, it does it instantaneously, as you just saw, where it takes all of the different elements, the notes you put in, um, along with the colored graph that you can share with someone. So if you're working on a project, if you want to consult an acoustician, you could send them this and be like, hey, looks like we might have a problem. What do you think? Or if the owner wants to spend money on lining all the ductwork, you can kind of show them what that would yield. So a pretty powerful program, to say the least. Um, I'm going to switch back over to here. Chris, you still showing your custom stuff at the end here? I am, yeah. Okay. I'm going to jump to that right now, actually. All right, just making sure. We squeezed it a little bit with all the commissions, which is good. Okay, get that back there. There we go. Yeah, so. Again, for the sake of time today, I can't get into like all the stuff you can do with this tool, but it's extremely powerful. And I encourage you, if you're dealing with a noisy issue, consider downloading it and giving it a shot or working with us and we can kind of help you through it. The last section here is kind of a really fun overview of just uh, integrated noise control solutions. We get brought into a lot of problems and we often provide support on the acoustic predictive side, but also on the engineering side, designing, uh, acoustically measuring, site surveys, and uh, manufacturing solutions to problems. And this section kind of goes through a lot of that. Acoustic panels are one of the product categories that we do a lot of work on that gets very large and kind of complex. This is a typical like acoustic plenum. These are average size American men standing inside uh, average size acoustical plenum. And this is kind of what they look like. These are all tongue and groove interlocking panels that basically build up large outdoor intake exhaust air plenums like that. We also do a lot of work in the outdoor environment for things like barrier walls. This was kind of a neat project in Atlanta that had a bakery supply company that was producing like dried goods, Betty Crocker mixes and had dehumidification units out in the parking lot disrupting the neighborhood quite extensively. 
we went to site and took sound measurements before and after and basically designed and proposed this barrier wall on two sides and acoustic panels mounted to the actual facility on the inside. And it worked extremely well for that purpose. Another area of noise control I didn't talk a lot about today is acoustic louvers. Acoustic louvers are a great device that basically allow you to ventilate a mechanical space while having that added transmission loss or insertion loss of the acoustic louvered blades. This is kind of a neat project in downtown Vancouver up in Canada, and it was a heritage building on a hotel that installed a lot of new mechanical equipment, and they didn't want it to be publicly seen. They wanted it kind of concealed, but also sound mitigated from producing noise into the environment. And acoustic louvers are a great option for that, where they were able to kind of color match it to the building and also fully conceal and cover it. You mentioned, Tom, um, stick built or built up air handlers. This is a neat job. I was actually just on the job site for about a month ago now. And uh, these are all price acoustic panels building up this massive air handler unit casing. And they couldn't get access into the building, but all the old fans and filters and heating coils needed a replacement. And we worked with them to build basically air handler unit casings using acoustic panels. Uh, these are all pressurized casings as well and cabinets and leakage was a big concern, but that tongue and groove interlocking connection works extremely well for erecting this very quickly, but also preventing, you know, sound and air leakage. The inside of all these casings were all perforated. This is actually the roof we're looking at here and kind of the walls at a weird angle I was standing at, but uh, we designed and build this all in-house with even laser cut openings in certain areas and provisions for structural steel supports. We do a lot of custom design work and our team is very experienced at CAD design too. We often do you know, full renderings and detailed drawings of stuff before they go into production uh, like this here. And I'll show a few examples of how we turn sort of a concept into reality on these integrated noise control solutions. This is kind of an interesting one. It was a generator housing application that had a large kind of louvered intake and they were getting tremendous noise kind of exiting out of the inlet side of this thing. So we designed a silencer and acoustic panel kind of enclosure around that entire intake section and it knocked down all of that noise quite extensively well. And uh, the silence were kind of penetrated through the enclosure and then there was access still into that building. I think one of the things that happens a lot is people go, oh, it's on an outside wall. I'll use an acoustic louver. Oh man, I can't get a lot of transmission loss out of an acoustic louver. Oh, well, you can't do anything about <laughs> it. And they forget that you can use a silencer. Yeah. Or you can use both. Yeah, even like a 12 inch deep louver doesn't give you that much insertion loss. Whereas, you know, a two or a three foot silencer, you can get some pretty extensive insertion loss from it. We do a lot of work with chillers and chillers make a lot of noise from a variety of areas, the compressors, the condensing fans. Um, there's a lot of chiller noise solutions that we've developed. This was kind of a unique one that required a lot of attenuation as well as inlet and outlet silencers and an acoustic panel kind of surround to knock down noise into the community. Um, we work together often with structural engineers as well. We have a few experienced structural engineers on our team that we design, you know, snow load, wind load, seismic structural constraints around. This is that job kind of in reality here. This is in Virginia. And what happened was this property owner kind of in behind installed a very loud chiller directly in the backyard of a high-end condo turned the thing on and then didn't think of the noise. And immediately they had like lawsuits being filed from the condo board onto the owner. So we designed this kind of acoustic abatement enclosure with silencers and panels. That's kind of a unique look at how to, to mitigate the noise from a chiller. Yeah, you can see how close the condo is there. Um, this looks kind of cool too in my mind. I don't know if I would mind that in my backyard as a noise control guy, but uh, worked extremely well. And we did pre and post sound measurements on this project to make sure we were meeting the guidelines, but uh, kind of a noisy chiller solution. Yeah, that's kind of a case study that we did on this one. Just a 
project team and Mauricio on my team, my uh, application engineering manager. Another thing we do a lot of, and one of the benefits that we have is that acoustic panels look a little bit industrial in their raw sort of unfinished state. In our Atlanta factory where most of these are built, we actually have a really high performing powder coat paint line. And when you powder coat these panels, it sort of changes the entire look and feel and architectural sort of usage of them, where they're less industrial, a little bit more architectural. This is kind of a neat job that we worked on last year in 22, and it's called Jefferson Middle School. Essentially what it was, was a school in Minnesota located in a very densely populated residential kind of area. Um, they installed a very expensive HVAC system on the roof of the school. And again, the noise levels were excessive. Um, we measured at the property line 80 dBC, which is very loud at a property line into literally a homeowner's backyard. It's supposed to be like 50, to be 50 and 60 in this case, 60 dBC was their threshold. Um, the property line wasn't really the issue for them. It was actually the neighbor's property, which was very close. We worked really closely with everyone involved on the project, the, the local rep, the mechanical contractor, um, an acoustician, the architect, to really come up with what we needed to do. And as you mentioned, Tom, the bylaws are usually that noise needs to be in that 55, 60 dBA range, or you're going to get into a lot of trouble. And Plus or minus case, 16. <laughs> yeah. So this is kind of the, the equipment. Um, there was a lot of equipment installed. It was a large school and there's air handlers and chillers and all sorts of stuff. And this is sort of the pre-construction pictures where there was multiple kind of units in series. You added all that steel? So that was pre Construction. This was our design that we came up with, which was basically a fully enclosed barrier wall with new steel being added to brace and hold everything up, and then a silencer package on the chiller, like we often do for controlling the compressor and the condensing fan noise. How much did that cost? Good question. I'll get to that. <laughs> so, again, pretty substantial noise package needed. And all the drawings that we did. Again, we painted everything. I'm not sure why those are in there again. We also did an extensive engineering package on this one with seismic, wind load. Wind was a big concern in the area that it was located. And we, uh, we provided all of the structural steel and PE stamping needed as well. The end result was quite um, positive. The owner, the community was extremely happy with the results. And we got some footage from a drone that's going to chug along here on my PowerPoint. But uh, this is sort of what these acoustic panels can be used for. That's actually Mauricio on my team down here with the sound meter taking measurements. The sun is kind of setting during this. So there's a weird kind of optical illusion on here of the shadowy sun set, but uh, a really neat kind of unique installation for acoustic panels. Um, one of the big things with this is we used our acoustic analysis tool to predict the noise level before we actually went into construction. And we were able to meet and exceed those values with what we actually provided, which was a big deal because obviously there was a pretty extensive cost involved with doing all this. But uh, at the point that we were hired, they really didn't have a lot of other options. So a really kind of neat solution. And you can see how close you know, the property line is to this equipment. And for whatever reason, they didn't think of sound as part of it. Uh, we were able to get it from 80 down to 61 DBC, which 65 was actually what they were shooting for at the property line. And at the homeowner, they wanted to be at 55, which we were able to do. And uh, we worked with the group at TMS Johnson in Minnesota for this one. Um, it was about a $200,000 noise control solution. So a lot of cost involved but a lot less than all the equipment and the rest of the, the battles they were facing. There's gonna be a neat article written on this one in our Priceless News, which uh, some of you may be on that distribution list. So take a look, look at that guy. A big thing on this one was they engaged with us very early. As soon as they heard there was an issue, the rep and the engineer were on the phone with us and we made a site visit. 
we do a lot of site visits on my team. My application engineering team will often come out to visit a job site and help through, you know, diagnosing a problem. Uh, we used our acoustic analysis tool to be able to model and depict what we were trying to do, and then did a lot of uh, site surveys and sound measurements and writing reports on what was able to be achieved. Um, we all did some really neat acoustic enclosures. So this one was a, a really fun project that not only had the acoustic part of it to consider, but the transportation of the enclosure. And what this was, was essentially a generator enclosure that was actually mounted to a fuel tank and then moved on a transport truck. Yeah. How long did that take from the first site visit to the final installation? Good question. I get asked that a lot. So it moved very quickly um, from the beginning stages of hearing of the problem until everything was installed. Uh, it was about five months, but you know, a lot of it was on the front end getting approvals and like from when we started cutting sheet metal to getting it installed, it was a very short window. Um, it was more the front end, understanding the problem, working with the equipment manufacturer, but it was about four yeah, or five the, months from the analysis now. probably took a couple of days. Yeah. And like the manufacturing of the product, um, the structural analysis took some time because there was differing mindsets on that, but yeah, it moved pretty quick. Um, yeah, yeah. So this was an interesting generator enclosure and this is kind of what it looks like. So same panels as the Jefferson example, tongue and groove interlocking panels, but used for basically something the size of like a semi truck uh, tri-van used to uh, attenuate the noise from a generator. One of the complexities of this project was we designed it to be lifted in a single piece. So you can see this is actually off the ground. There's a lot of loading and, you know, bracing that's needed to be able to do that. But the manufacturer of these generators wanted to be able to mount and wire and run the generator in advance of the enclosures coming into play. So kind of a really unique solution around uh, generator noise. Do you work with specific generator manufacturers? We do, yeah. We work with a lot of manufacturers, to be honest. Um, and we don't really have like, you know, um, allegiances to certain ones, but we like to solve noise problems. So we work with a lot of fan manufacturers, a lot of chiller manufacturers, a lot of general manufacturers um, to be able to do this. And if there's people in your community that need noise control, hook us up, Tom. But we do a lot of this. And these, this one was one of my like probably most interesting projects because of the level of detail that was required. A lot of these large generator manufacturers have extremely high quality control requirements too. Not that we don't in HVAC, but maybe not as much as like, you know, automotive in terms of like paint finishes and tolerances and structural engineering considerations. So a really neat kind of project I'd love to share. We also do a lot of work in data centers. Data centers are very popular and there's a lot of data centers kind of coming online. And uh, we do a lot of work for things like barrier walls, as well as fan housings like this, where different types of fans, whether they're, you know, I think this is like a Zeal Auburg fan maybe, need acoustical housings. And this is again, acoustical panel housings for a fan um, that would otherwise be, you know, transmitting that noise into the environment. Um, we put silencers on really any type of fan. This is actually happening as we speak right now. These are cook up blast fans that make a lot of noise and uh, we're designing- Need a little bit of noise. A little bit of noise. <laughs> um, we design silencers that can go on these and these are kind of custom and we're actually doing some like retrofitting in our own facility here um, to try and design a new up blast fan silencer, which is kind of a neat application. That's kind of cool. Uh, chillers are a big noise problem with condensing fans and compressors, and these are actually silencers mounted to the uh, condensing fan section of a chiller. I've seen guys put uh, blankets around the compressors. Is that worth its salt? I think seen they do work, but to limited effect. Like a blanket can only absorb so much. They're kind of thin, mass loaded vinyl products. Um, sometimes they're a good option, though, where you don't have a lot of like space or because when you get a an acoustic some information off a chiller you just get 
sound power levels. Yeah. With the ambient noise, you don't necessarily know what the Where it's compressor coming. is actually. Yeah. Oh, let's throw a compressor blanket on it. We get, still got the whole problem. Yeah, we've seen like acoustic louvers being mounted at the bottom or acoustic like silencers, but blankets can work. And I think these might even have some like mass loaded vinyl blankets on there. Um, we also do some really funky stuff. So this is this is VRF equipment. Um, I don't know a lot about VRF personally. You guys may know more, but the, the outside part of a VRF unit makes a lot of noise. And this was at a like a retirement condo complex that had all this VRF stuff directly outside the windows of residents. And we designed kind of a panel silencer discharge area for them to be all located within, which worked very well. Um, we do some really kind of crazy stuff as well. Custom semi-industrial stack silencers. This was a project we provided last year. These are massive circular silencers on the discharge of a, a big assembly. We don't have a lot of information on the project. It was quite confidential for the purpose it's being used due to some concerns, but uh, very high temperature and high static pressure ratings that uh, we do stuff like that too. To give you a sense of how large these are, that's like a typical flatbed 50 foot trailer. So massive stuff. And we don't really shy away from that either. So um, generators are the last one I was going to touch on. And we do a lot of work on generators. Big silencer banks are often common where uh, we design kind of things like this, where there's a plenum together with a silencer to help attenuate the noise from these massive generators. Um, hard to get pictures of a lot of these because they're in deep, dark caverns of generator houses, but kind of unique solutions around generators. This is a really fun one I like to share as well. Uh, so where I'm from up in Winnipeg in Canada, the river freezes solid, about four feet thick in ice. And for whatever crazy reason, we go out there and ice skate in the winter. And we got invited to a competition. It was an architectural and art competition to design and build one of these warming huts. So people go in to these little huts and like lace up their skates and drink a hot chocolate. And uh, this is a price acoustic panel warming hut on the, uh, the Red River up in Winnipeg. One of the neat things with it is we designed and built this right in the heart of the pandemic. And we had a lot of really crazy restrictions in Canada around gathering together with people and all sorts of stuff. And this was designed in such a way that the middle of it is a plexiglass window between the two sides. And it's all perforated metal kind of anechoic chamber. And one person can go on one side and the other can go on the other side and you're kind of together while apart. So I don't know, architects are interesting people, but we worked with them and came up with a really neat kind of neat concept. So acoustic panels are extremely customizable, but uh, yeah. Which kind of, you won? We did win some awards for it. Architect competitions are weird again. No architects in the room, is there? I apologize if I tell you, but it was one of those competitions at the end. It was kind of like, everybody wins. <laughs> We're like, oh, okay, where's our award? <laughs> But uh, yeah, the final slide I had is just, there's better ways to control noise. This is actually a real picture from people trying to stop the noise from some sort of HVAC unit. I think these are like floor mats and duct tape and there's better ways. And I really encourage you guys to work with us and the airflow team. Um, there's a lot of great you know, solutions to noise, whether it's HVAC or otherwise, and uh, we can help in, in a variety of matters. So I hope this was useful. Time kind of flew for me at least. Three hours goes by quickly, sure. but I uh, How hope about I a nice hand for our speaker, Chris? It's 1159, so I don't know how I timed that so Perfect. Perfect. All right, so lunch is here, everybody. Hang out as long as you like. You're welcome to stay. You want to do the draw for these real quick? Maybe oh, just quickly. Yeah, we'll do that. Sure. What's the best way to do this? Uh, how did you do it in the past? Just call uh, some numbers or pick a prize and call the numbers? Drop the um, drop your tickets into the here. Okay. Oh, there's a question. Oh, there's um, there's somebody who said you're in the chat. Okay, I'm just gonna pick random tickets and then I'll give you a prize, whatever I feel is you're ready. Let's just thank you. Yeah. Thanks to everybody who was remote.
Okay, I think they all started in 555. So let's see the last four numbers. 